Anyway, welcome everybody. My name is Steve Alexander from MSP Ignite. We are fortunate this afternoon to have our friends from Huntress Labs provide you with some educational content, some interactive discussion, all around cybersecurity, of course. I will stay on this call and, and pretend to be attentive, but Jeremy already knows when I'm not, he can call me out. So does John, actually. Danielle probably now does too. Um, so you guys can call me out, but I'll be on as well. But really, this is a Huntress roundtable meeting for you guys, for you guys to talk about cybersecurity, to learn more about what Huntress wants to share. Huntress Labs, excuse me, wants to share. Um, and with that, I am going to turn this over to, to Jeremy. Um, but I have to do his intro and do it the right way. Oh, man, you guys hit my screen and messed up my intro because I love the intro so much. So Jeremy, Jeremy's joining us from lovely Austin, Texas, where I'm sure it's a little warmer than it is here in New York. He's been working in tech and cybersecurity in particular for over a decade and was serving time at HP and Verizon before joining Huntress Labs. Um, I just love that part. Uh, before joining Huntress, Jeremy spent a couple of years on the Duo MSP team as well, advocating for MFA to be a standard for all MSPs. He's really excited to present to you today and is always entertaining so, Jeremy, I'm going to turn this over to you and everybody else at Huntress Labs. Thanks, Steve. You're going to have to come back in and do Danielle and John's bios, too, now that you did one. It's a package deal. I'm happy to if someone sends them to me or I'll make them <laughs> up. If you guys are comfortable with me making something up, I will gladly do that. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to the MSP Ignite Roundtable Huntress Edition. Today, we have... Uh, three sessions lined up. I'll start off with talking about threat hunting. Danielle will take you through evolving the hunt to help you understand what Huntress does for your business. And then John's going to bring us home with a session teaching about teaching your techs some basic threat hunting as well. So before we dive in, I want to point out that if I say anything that sounds smart today, it might come from my experience in the security industry or more likely, it's something I learned from Anton Shivakin. Uh, He wrote the go-to paper on threat hunting back in 2017. He works at Google Cloud on the security side over there. I suggest if you haven't read anything of his, start following his blogs. He's got a good one there on Medium and really entertaining and topical and very knowledgeable. So let's start at the beginning here. What is threat hunting? Threat hunting is an analyst-centric process that enables organizations to uncover hidden advanced threats that are missed by automated prevention and detective controls. Only a few of the most security mature companies in the world can really afford to do this in-house 24 seven. It's a fusion of people, technology and process that enables creative minds to outsmart attackers. In short, it's incredibly rare. And as Gartner points out in their seminal writings on threat hunting, effective threat hunting is incredibly rare due to its reliance on uniquely skilled personnel. Only a few companies in the defense industrial base and financial services boast productive threat hunting teams that deliver results. So in reality, less than 1% of companies on the planet have threat hunters on staff who can go toe to toe with talented attackers. Traditionally, threat hunting is only something you do after you've exhausted all avenues with tools. So once a company gets to a point where they still find the risks from undetected threats unreasonable, going on the offense with threat hunting is their last line of defense. Imagine you guys being able to afford all of these tools. Must be right, right? right? Must be nice. The cost of those tools pales in comparison with the budget needed for the people you have to employ to run them. This is a look from a Microsoft blog on how to organize your security team. Must be nice to be able to afford, attract, and retain the world's top security talent, right? You need an annual budget of more than $20 million a year to do all of that. And if you think I'm exaggerating, think again. Microsoft spends over a billion dollars a year on security alone. That's why only 1% of companies can actually afford to run a security organization that could employ full-time threat hunters. But what are the key characteristics of a great hunter? They need to be proactive. Hunting is about looking for the intruder before any alerts get generated. Hunting focuses on creating and testing hypotheses and then following clues and ideas, not just chasing alerts from tools. Hunters assume that a breach has occurred. 
and that traces, however subtle, have been left by the attackers in your IT environment. Most ex experts agree that hunting is not about following the rules. It's, it's rather a creative process and a loose methodology focused on outsmarting skilled human attacker. And it's very knowledge reliant. Threat hunting relies on both advanced threat knowledge and this deep knowledge of an organization's IT environment. Organizations then learn more about their IT environment through the hunting process to find these places where attackers can hide. And when we say that effective threat hunters are incredibly rare, let's better understand why. If you were to post a job op opening online, what requirements would a hunter need to have? You need to have security tool skills and understanding of a tier three SOC technician. You need to have network and Windows administration skills of a tier three NOC and tier three end user support technician. You need to have offensive security knowledge and tool skills of a pen tester, and then cyber forensics and incident response skills of a tier three DFIR tech. Ask any recruiter and they'll tell you you'll have a better luck finding a real life unicorn. So let's take a moment to dispel some common misconceptions. Threat hunting is not something that can be fully automated. Hunters use tools, but that's not where they start. It's not a SIM or an EDR analyst chasing down alerts to find a breach. It's not subscribing to threat intelligence service and then adding detections to your SIM. And it's not something you do before or instead of preventative tools. It's complementary. It tries to make those gaps between the tools that much smaller. The term uh, threat hunting can be traced back to the 2000s to an elite team at the Air Force deemed the, the hunter killer team that were notorious for rooting out and killer, killing attacker access in government systems. The NSA picked up the vernacular in 2009 and started to describe how their team hunts for adversaries in a proactive way. In 2011, Tau Security posted a, an article entitled Become a Hunter, and that's really what helped bring the term into the mainstream. The Threat Hunting Project posted some foundational hunting resources in 2015, and threathunting.net is still live. It's still out there. You can go and get some of those resources today. And then 2016 is, in 2017 is kind of where the analysts, the likes of Sands and Gartner, start to get in on the fun and pick this up and, and really start to talk about it in a mainstream way. Like everything, hunters have a process. In reality, it's much more fluid, relies on individual skill, intuition, and creativity. But if you had to put it down on paper, it would look something like this. Starts with a hypothesis. I, as a hunter, see a weakness in my company's environment, and I make a bet that someone has already exploited that weakness. And then I come up with a guess on how, and then I test that theory. I can use information from many tools in my hunting, but I'm not basing my inquiry on alerts. I'm looking for things that wouldn't generate alerts. Ultimately, at the end of my hunt, if I find nothing, great news. That's awesome. That weakness wasn't as bad as I thought it was, but I probably found a few holes to be patched along the way. And maybe I found a different big gap that will spawn my next hypothesis for the next hunt. If I did find something, that first triggers an incident. And, and an incident response. Once the remediations are complete, we can take the lessons learned, turn them into new detections so that the next time this happens, it's more closely to automatically detected. So I don't have to hunt for the same thing over and over and over again. There are numerous reasons why companies would want to threat hunt. A lot of them are listed here. Overall, hunting is a way to flip the age old security maxim the defender needs to be right 100% of the time to keep attackers out, but the attacker needs to be right only once to get in. With hunting, that script gets flipped, and attacker's sole mistake is likely to lead to their discovery and removal, while the defender can cast its net as many times as it wants to try and find that mistake. So where does the hunting focus? What you see here is a snippet from the MITRE ATT&CK Enterprise Matrix. It highlights lots of attacker tactics, techniques, procedures, any one of these things could be the starting point for a hypothesis for a hunter to test. But the problem is that most of these rely on local context, company and organizational specific information. If I don't know that Jeremy lives in Austin, how am I supposed to know that when you stumble upon a device getting access from Jeremy's credentials with an IP address in Boston, 
that that's abnormal. You have to understand the inner workings of an organization to apply a lot of this stuff. Okay, fine. This is great. What does this all mean to an SMB? Most small and medium businesses don't have the security budget for any of this stuff. They're still using firewalls and antivirus, not a whole lot else. And if you don't have a budget, what in you, you expect your partner to take care of the security, but the partners themselves are often relying on third party partners for their security. So now we're three degrees of separation from understanding the local context of the actual organization. So security partners focus on chasing down alerts from expensive tools, layering expensive people on top of expensive tools without understanding the local environment is oftentimes can be a waste of money that doesn't produce the stellar security outcomes you're looking for. So a lot of SMBs end up with a pretty bare bones security stack. In short, this leaves a lot of SMBs as sitting ducks. The data backs this up. For example, despite the big names in the headlines, ransomware remains a disproportionate problem for SMB and mid-market businesses. Most of the ransomware attacks, 80 plus percent, have fewer than 1,000 employees. And I'm sure that you probably get the objection from your customers. We're not really a target. Nobody's coming after us. What value have we have to an attacker? Turns out it doesn't really matter what vertical these companies are in. Cyber criminals are very opportunistic. Wherever the low-hanging fruit is, that's what they're taking. But now we know that threat hunting gives us the ability to detect threats before alerts happen so the attackers don't get to the point where they're causing damage but only 1% of companies can afford it. So how do we bring threat hunting to the other 99%? Rational people might ask, but how would that be possible? There's no way to effectively hunt without expensive data gathering tools. There's no way to hunt without proper local context. There's no, not to mention, without the hefty budget and an army of incredibly rare threat hunters. This will be impossible at scale. You're wasting your time. And even if you do it, there's no demand. SMBs don't know what they're missing. And that means the partners that serve them don't care either. Now, imagine this. You're an elite hacker who started at a young age and your cyber antics got you noticed enough that you got recruited while still in high school by the Air Force to join their cyberspace operations group. You then get recruited by the NSA where you get teamed up with more of the top hackers in the world. In your spare time, you compete and capture the flag events and eventually win the World Series of Hacking at DEF CON. Your team at the NSA is killing it, developing exploits that alerting tools can't see and creating long-term access that nothing and no one ever finds. Until one day you ask yourself a question, why isn't this harder? It shouldn't be this easy to break into and maintain access environments where even when organizations have unlimited budget, if that's the case, why does an SM, what chance does an SMB have? And then you decide to create a product that would have actually have a chance of stopping you if you attacked a target who used it. If you want to build a $100 million company, all the experts say that the success, easy way to success is go after the enterprise. It's faster to bag one elephant than to find and sell to 10,000 on this chart flies. But if you're, but your goal isn't to help the 1% of companies that can already afford all the proper security controls, you want to help the 99% that don't have the means. So what if you take a new approach? To hunt at scale as a third party, you'd have to do it without expensive data gathering tools like SIM, EDR, NIDs, et cetera, without local context. What if you look at this from an offensive security perspective? What would a hacker do? What if you could whittle all the attacks down to the lowest common denominator? Which layers don't need local context? What's the weakest link in the attack chain? The link that if removed, the whole thing breaks. From your experience, you know that if your long-term persistent access to the environment is removed, meaning your access doesn't survive a simple reboot or a password change, jig is up. Your cover is blown. It's time to move on. Persistence is the most important, most ubiquitous part of the attack chain that nobody really understands. And last time that John and I were presenting on MSP Ignite, he said something in that presentation. And so Steve, this can be, I'm gonna attribute this partially to you for organizing it. So, and I took this quote from that session 
John, do you remember saying this? I think I do. So basically the gist of it was uh, over 90% of attacks use persistence tactics, right? And that's what we know. That's what offensive attackers know, but not everybody in the defensive side does. So after the break-in, Establishing a persistent foothold is the attacker's top priority, but it's also an attacker bottleneck. If you were to search for a definition of persistence, you'll get a pretty clear description from MITRE. Adversaries use persistence to keep access to systems across restarts, change credentials, and other interruptions that could cut off their access. Techniques used for persistence include any access, action, or configuration changes that let them maintain their foothold on systems, such as replacing or hijacking legitimate code or adding startup code. But how many of these things can there be? These should be easy to spot, right? Hundreds of auto starting components of Windows, commonly referred to as auto runs, are running on your PCs right now. These things are virtually never investigated. From an attacker's point of view, that's great. I can play in here for months and you would never know. But it also works out from a hunting perspective. If you are one of the few humans on the planet who knows what to look for, you can hunt for imposter auto runs without understanding the local context of the organization. And there are always plenty of these things to hunt through. It's not uncommon to see between 800 and 2000 auto running components of Windows per operating system. But where do these things come from? How many times... Corey, have you in your life sat through a software installation? Under that pretty little progress bar, the installation is creating new files, new folders, schedule tasks, run keys, services. This is all a normal part of using computers. Every month, Windows updates your machine. Dozens of new auto running items are created, but not all of these things are good. Unfortunately, if you click the wrong link online in an email, enable the wrong macro in an office document, click to run the wrong, wrong installer, that can add startup code to your PC as well. And those aren't as easy to find or get rid of. And now you may at some point think that like I have, I pay a lot for my prevention software. I should be covered. Preventative security tools are focused on blocking things that show up on top of Windows, things that get written to disk. So advanced threats have evolved to live inside the operating system, in the registry and in memory in places where your preventive tools either can't block things or won't block things without the risk of corrupting and shutting down the OS itself. Again, who here has ever had a software program lead to a blue screen of death for one of your users? What did you do? You chased down that tool that caused it. You probably uninstalled it. AV providers won't take that risk. So they simply whitelist the entire category of underlying OS components, which is why it's a perfect place for attacker to play. Finally, inspecting these Windows components helps better align to a zero trust framework. Zero trust simply means that you make all the things in your environment pass the same checks before you trust them. This can be applied to people, devices, workloads, workplaces. Right now, these auto starting Windows components get absolutely zero inspection. They're blindly trusted. With specialists hunting through them to ensure they're there for a good reason, doing what they're supposed to, and that there are no rogue imposters among us, you're aligning auto starting components of your operating system to a zero trust metho methodology. The specialist approach makes sense. If you think about it, if you go to a general practitioner with a persistent foothold problem, foot problem, are they going to heal it? No, they're going to send you to a podiatrist, right? So instead of trying to boil the ocean and claim that you can stop every bad thing that could ever happen, you get laser focused on incredibly important weak link in the chain of persistence. By narrowing the focus of the hunt, your hypothesis can always be the same. Malicious persistent footholds are present. You gather all the data on all the persistence mechanisms, then hunt through them to find things that shouldn't be there. When found, you'd remove them and then add detections to find them faster in the future. To productize this, to do it at scale, you need an agent to gather data, be able to send it to a cloud repository. You'd apply proprietary detections and intelligence from prior hunts to detect previously 
uh, detect discovered threats and then sort the rest of it into a queue. You'd need skilled analysts to then hunt through that queue and then help with incident response and write detections. And you'd want your deliverable to be an incident report that provides clear analysis with step-by-step -step remediation instructions. Guess what? This is how Huntress provides security for the 99%. While we may not have these hackers, we've got our own. That kid that accidentally hacked his way into the Air Force, that's our CEO. The Air Force nicknamed him Citizen Cyber. That's not a joke. This is the, it's on the internet. You can search for it. Kyle met Chris and John, our other co-founders, during their time in the intelligence community. It was their job during their decade tenure at the NSA to carry out extremely sophisticated cyber warfare on the targets they were assigned. They helped create some of the exploits and persistence techniques that they're helping Huntress customers expel from their systems today. It's their offensive expertise that's behind our threat operations team, and it's what empowers their ability to hunt at scale. Danielle will take you more through this, but how Huntress works might now look familiar. If you remember the two outcomes from the threat hunt that finds something, we've incorporated them into our deliverable. Huntress provides the uh, incident report that shows exactly what the issue is, where it is, the other security products installed on the device, how to get rid of it, that kind of stuff. We've even taken it a step further, added an easy button. So all you have to do is click to approve and the agent will be tasked to automatically perform those actions on your behalf. We find stuff that slips by all the preventative layers. This one had CrowdStrike, this one had Sentinel one this one had Sophos, just to name a few, we could do that all day. I can show you redacted reports where we're clean up what all the AV, next-gen EV, EDRs are missing. It's not because they're not doing their job. We're just built to do very different things. If you don't have a background in security, it's completely understandable to have a hard time figuring out what the difference is between AV, next-gen AV, EDR, SIM, outsource SOC, just having an MSSP manage it all for you. Antivirus is so ubiquitous because it's so affordable. Next Gen AV is a little more expensive, but it can still be operated without a security team after some fine tuning based on the local context. EDR and SIM, powerful tools, but not as valuable unless you have experienced security professionals to run them. So a lot of customers and, and partners partner to outsource that piece of it. And then they can get mixed results because the partners have no insight into that local context. So other than Huntress, there's just not a lot that can offer persistent threat hunting that isn't both stinking expensive and still requires your own security resources to provide that local context. And for generations now, the AV industry has focused their efforts on building better mousetraps, spending billions of dollars on advertising to make you believe the newest trap is worth what they're charging. Put out traps, you're going to catch some mice. And yes, that is a Wi-Fi enabled next gen mousetrap. Who knew? But once in the house, the smart mice will still find a way to get the cheese, trap or no. What you really need is an exterminator to hunt down and destroy the nest and remove the footholds into your home. While preventative security software doesn't find or expel persistent footholds, Huntress hunts down and helps exterminate the attacker persistence that your preventative tools aren't able to detect. So the, for the first four years, we were solely focused on hunting for footholds. During 2020, we worked our tail off to add value to our partners. We released three new services last year without increasing our costs at all. We're now a platform, still a single SKU. Uh, in early 21, 2021, we announced our first acquisition of Level Effect, whose technology is an EDR solution that merges endpoint forensics with sophisticated network traffic visibility with no appliance required. Once integrated uh, into our platform, we will be able to respond to malicious network sessions, event logs, non-persistent threats, allowing us to support broader cybersecurity use cases and defend additional attack surfaces. Those integration efforts, of course, are ongoing. And then earlier this month, don't know if you saw this, we announced our Series B raise of an additional $40 million to help Huntress remain independent and accelerate our growth on all of these efforts. Uh, last, late last year, Thomas Bosert, Homeland Security Advisor to multiple administrations, wrote a piece for the New York Times. In it, he called out, cyber threat hunters that are stealthier than the Russians must be unleashed on our networks to look for hidden persistent access controls. These information security professionals actively search for, isolate, and remove advanced malicious code that evades automated safeguards. What he was describing 
what he's making an open plea to the U.S. government and all the companies to start doing is exactly what we've been laser focused on since our inception, hunting for those persistent footholds. On May 12th, just a couple of weeks ago, President Biden signed an executive order to improve U.S. cybersecurity standards and further combat threats against the nation. In it, he calls for improving detection response and improving investigation and remediation. If proactive detection, cyber threat hunting, containment and remediation are important enough terms to be penned on the president's desk, it's absolutely worth incorporating into our cybersecurity strategies. We do have a trial. If you want to try us out, free for unlimited systems for 21 days or your first three higher critical reports, hunters.com slash trial to get started on that. I'll leave my contact up here for a few minutes and we'll open the floor to questions from discussion. But first, I have a question for the audience. Do you now feel armed with enough information about threat hunting that when an AV vendor tells you that they do threat hunting, you can confidently ask the question, what does threat hunting mean to you? And engage in a meaningful discussion thereafter. Corey, I saw you come off mute for a second. I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> yes, for sure. Um, it's always cool to, to go back and, and challenge them on what they're really doing. And I, I love the fact that you're able to, to show where each of these things sit on a chart and, and where they're persistent. Um, not saying that they're not good, but just want to make sure we're having a, a good, meaningful conversation that they're able to do what they say they're doing. All, all security tools are, are, are tools for a reason, right? They all add something. The question is, with your business, with your audience, your market, can you get the value out of those tools that they were intended for? Because so many of them were built by defenders with the idea of, I'm going to try and boil the ocean and stop all attacks. But that requires a very specific skill set to wield those tools and, and get results out of them. And us in the MSP space, we've always been about outsourcing IT and we've kind of inherited the security piece and I'm not here and, and people, I, I hope not too many people anymore are telling you, you need to become an MSSP. No, you, you just need to know good things about security and, and you need to treat it as a piece of your business and then have that flow down to your customers. But I, I'm hoping this armed you because threat hunting is, it started in, what was that? Two, uh, 2007 or so. It has become a marketing term that gets thrown around everywhere. And I'm hoping this armed you guys with some more uh, arrows in the quiver to be like, let's, let's talk about threat hunting. Like, what, what do you mean by that? Because when you boil it down a lot of places, it means we have analysts who will go search down and look at the alerts that our, uh, our software creates, which that's a great service. It's just not the same thing. Any other comments, questions? I think we've had some stuff in the chat that I haven't been able to see yet. Are most of the people on this call actually uh, customers of yours or not customers of yours? I see names and I don't, I see, don't see business names. So I'm, I, to be off of, to honest, I'm not entirely sure on the whole list. Well, I am. And uh, one thing you didn't mention was that your product also has canaries which has really been helpful uh, in a lot of instances for us. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Danielle and her next segment will definitely go more into that piece and some of the other services on it. Uh, my intention was try to give a little bit more information into the threat hunting specific piece of the kind of history of why we went down that road to begin with. Uh, but yeah, Danielle's, Danielle's definitely going to get more into the actual platform. Uh, Corey, I see you messing with me on the waiting for the Kyle moment coming. You're totally called it. Yeah. Uh, sorry, looking through the chat here now. Uh, all right. I don't see anything else. Any other comments, concerns, Steve? No, I don't. Questions, see discussion else, points? Nothing for me. Anyone else on, on the call? Have any questions for Jeremy based on what he just presented? Then let's hand it over to Danielle. 
All right. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate that. Um, so today, guys, um, what I'm going to be talking to you about is a little bit more product detail. Um, this is going to be Huntress, but make it education. I make it educational. So we're going to zoom out a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about um, the tool itself, but we're also going to talk about how we got here, right? How did antivirus, how did firewalls, how did those kind of basic levels of security, when did those not become enough, right? And why are we showing you guys uh, another, another offering, perhaps if you haven't already considered something like Huntress, this might be an additional offering for you. So how did we really get here? So we're going to be covering that. And then um, we're also going to be covering the fact that we're cybersecurity for the 99%. I'll explain that a little more in a minute. But um, for those of you folks who don't know me, I'm Danielle. I'm a senior account ex executive here at Huntress. I work on the sales team. Um, if you guys have any questions on Huntress, feel free to ping me afterwards. I'll give you my contact info. So let's address the obvious here first. So securing the SMB, it's, it's a huge responsibility. There's no way around it. It's definitely a tall task, especially when we consider kind of what we're up against here in, in the cybersecurity uh, warfare space. And with that said, how can we bring cybersecurity to everybody, not just enterprise, not just mid-market clients that have deep pockets, but how do we bring this to SMBs as well? And probably the biggest challenge that a lot of our SMBs face is that they either don't realize that they need cybersecurity um, or they don't know how to go about implementing it. Has anyone faced those problems with their SMBs before? I'd imagine probably every single person in this room has had that conversation with their customers with one of those two outcomes, not knowing they need it or not knowing how to go about it, right? And then um, secondly, how can we make it easier for you guys, our partners, our potential partners to bring security to your clients? And with Huntress, what we've realized that the channel is key here, right? Um, in order for SMBs to be able to implement security solutions, they need help from the channel. They need help from MSPs, from you guys. So we created cybersecurity that is purpose built for the channel to help advance our mission which kind of ties into that cybersecurity for the 99% mantra. Um, there's this idea of the cybersecurity poverty line, right? Um, everybody should have a minimum level of security to defend themselves from an attack. A lot of SMBs fall below that cybersecurity poverty line. And this is one of our goals here at Huntress is how can we help you elevate SMBs above the, that a cybersecurity poverty line. As such, we want to deliver cybersecurity for the 99%, so to speak. We're all in this fight together, essentially. We're working towards the same goals here. Um, at Huntress, we just have our own role to play. So first, we have to streamline defense. So we want to make security more accessible so that we can make it easier to adopt. That's challenge number one. Um, this was very much the theme of our transition to a security platform. We're going to talk about that a little later, but for those of you folks who have been with us for a while, you know that Huntress kind of started out with just one or two core, kind of core offerings, and we've expanded that quite a bit to be now not just one or two features that you guys can use, but a whole security platform with multiple different features that will help you guys enhance your security stack. Um, so our, our kind of question was, how do we bring more tools to you, but not add more tech to your plate? Um, how do we do this in a way that enables adoption amongst your client base as well? What you guys are gonna see with our platform is the addition of new services without any additional cost so that we can make defense more palatable without all of those kind of procurement pricing add-on type of headaches. And that's something that we've held true to um, over the past few years is that we've added additional services to our offering at no additional cost with our kind of greater mission of being, hey, we're trying to elevate those SMBs above that cybersecurity poverty level. Now, the second part is we want to be able to continuously improve and iterate quickly. Attackers are always evolving. We need to keep up or at least try <laughs> by staying on top of threat research. Um, you know, there are a lot of different types of challenges that you guys face as MSPs um, with regard to economic shifts, global shifts, digital shifts. Has anybody heard of this thing called COVID? I mean, that, that definitely threw a monkey wrench into a lot of the ways that we did business last year. Even things as recent as the pipeline attack, right? Shifts are happening in the cybersecurity space um, all the time. 
making sure that you're achieving your goals ultimately ties directly into Huntress achieving our goals. So we wanna help you kind of keep up with some of those shifts. And then uh, the last piece here is that um, we know that cybersecurity is not just about tools. So tools will only get you so far. Um, there are processes that you guys need to implement. You know, there are people that you guys need to add. How can we teach our audiences how security plays a part in their overall goals? We talked about this a little bit on the last slide. We want to ensure our audiences acknowledge risks and kind of minimize them when it comes to our ability to perform business functions, because that's ultimately the goal. We want you guys to be able to perform those business functions, um, not have downtime, right? Not have major interruptions to your clients, uh, you know, day to day. This is where partner enablement comes in, and it should be part of every vendor interaction you guys have in this day and age. Jeremy, I think you said it well. Hunters, um, hunters use tools, right? Um, but that's not where they start. <laughs> the people portion here is what's really, really important. You can't just rely just on tools and automation alone. You have to have a good team um, in order to kind of make sure that you're enabled to be doing what you've you know, uh, devoted your business to, which is helping your customers. Okay, with that said, so how can you guys position Huntress? Um, in other words, where do we fit in your security stack? So as you guys can imagine, we get this question a lot here at Huntress. Um, there are lots of different kind of frameworks, attack timelines that show where Huntress really fits into your stack. Um, we're going to cover a couple of them today. I know Jeremy covered a couple too. Um, but let us know if there's any frameworks that we might have missed because we'd be happy to kind of show you where we might fit with regard to any other frameworks that you guys you know, know of or make use of. So the way that we like to explain Huntress, and this is a great analogy you guys can use in conversations with your clients, is um, imagine if you guys called a plumber right? You called the plumber, they drove up to your house, they had the truck with the logo of the company that you called, they walk up to your door, and they're in their jumpsuit, and they've got their name tag, and they have, you know, their tool belt as well. And when you let them in your front door, they don't go anywhere near your bathroom, they don't go anywhere near your kitchen, and instead they make a beeline for your safe, right? Or make a beeline for your, for your jewelry box. Um, this is what we're looking to detect at Huntress. Those things that may look like legitimate services, right? This looks like a legitimate plumber by all for all intents and purposes, but realistically, they're not behaving like how a plumber would behave, right? So Huntress is there in your security house to say, hey, this is uh, not how a plumber is supposed to behave. We're going to show you how to identify this behavior and then kick them out of your house so that they don't return for good. So one of the ways that we can kind of um, help illustrate this is via the NIST cybersecurity framework. So um, as Jeremy kind of touched on, we've got, you know, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. That's the framework that NIST describes would help you guys kind of compartmentalize uh, your security offering and make this um, really kind of easy to digest, easy to understand on how to compose uh, a, a, a comprehensive security stack. So we have identify, that's first, right? We want to first identify what assets we have to protect. How do we know how to protect those assets if we can't identify them? It's obvious. And then we have protect is our next category. This is where your AV, your firewalls, your DNS security, your multi-factor authentication kind of fall. And then we have boom. Boom here is our incident. Boom is the day when your hair is on fire. Boom is the day when everybody dreads, right? When you discover that someone has managed to make your make their way onto your device that's got unauthorized access. Um, you'll notice that under detect and respond, there's not a lot of tools that kind of will help check this box for SMBs. Um, when most MSPs look at this, they realize that they're putting a lot of stock in preventative controls to get the job done. And if those tools don't get that job done, they really don't have a way of stemming that infection until it's too late. And at that point, you run a higher risk of having your data stolen or um, having your systems encrypted because you're being reactive, right? It's uh, you're being reactive to the right of this boom line versus you know being proactive, like to the left of this boom line, right? Being proactive by putting your uh, preventative security tools in place. A lot of MSPs will tell me um, that's why I have backups, right? Uh, that's why I have a disaster recovery plan. There's two problems with that though. So 
Backups and disaster recovery plans are absolutely necessary, don't get me wrong, but cyber criminals know that a first step that a business is going to take is going to try to restore from backups. So in order to kind of make sure that they still get paid, <laughs> they'll start infecting your backups or deleting them, right, so that you have absolutely no choice, you have to pay them their ransom. Sometimes they'll even exfiltrate data and they'll use that to blackmail their victims into paying. If you guys aren't familiar with groups like Mays or Soda Nakibi, those are two groups that are notorious for that blackmail extortion tactic combined with ransomware. Um, and then two, when you're dealing with these events, the businesses affected are down typically for a long period of time, right? And of course you wanna prevent downtime. Um, you know, even if you guys can't prevent downtime altogether, minimizing it is definitely a best, um, you know, second best. So this is where we fit with Huntress. We're trying to help you kind of address these gaps under detect and respond primarily. So we're what the industry calls an MDR provider. Our job is to be proactive. We wanna identify threats for our partners and for their clients um, so that we can get them stopped and you guys can remove them before we're dealing with a worst case catastrophic scenario. So how we do that is to provide a tool that goes above and beyond the automation-based tools that you guys are using in your preventative security stack. And the, the key here is that human layer, right? The key to successful detection and response is humans. You have to absolutely have that human element in order to be able to see things that AVs, that firewalls, that DNS security might miss. Um, the big takeaway here, though, before I kind of get into the details of what we do, you can't prevent a business from experiencing a cyber attack, period. Um, but you can absolutely put strong controls in place to the left of Boom to help minimize that likelihood. When something makes it pass, though, your goal should always be to detect or stop it before it becomes a breach or before it becomes a major problem for the business. And you guys might be looking at this and saying, okay, great, you guys do detection and response, but I also see we have a little bit of protection here as well. We'll talk about that in a second, but this is one of the features that we have in beta right now uh, for our offering. It's called Managed AV. It's incorporating multi-tenancy for Windows Defender. And we can chat a little bit, of, bit more about the details uh, towards the end of this presentation. You guys can think about it this way. So for a long time, our cybersecurity really focused primarily on preventative measures exclusively. So think about entry into, you know, a, a large event, right? I know it's probably been a while since we've been to a large event, but let's say like a concert, right? If you guys remember concerts or basketball game or whatever it might be, something happening in a big arena. Uh, there are turnstiles where staff can scan your ticket and let you into the building. So imagine you're trying to get in without a legitimate ticket. Um, you're probably going to be stopped right there at the turnstiles before you even get inside. So if you were a bad actor, if you really wanted, you know, access into that basketball game or that concert without having to pay for a legitimate ticket, um, one of the first things that I would personally do is I would invest in ways to make your ticket look more legitimate. Right. So we use tools like firewalls and antivirus to scan the legitimacy of data before it enters your environment in an effort to stop the bad actors before they gain access. That's your turnstile. Um, attackers will respond to those preventative measures and change their techniques to find unique ways to still get through. That's the person that, you know, tries to kind of beef up their their fake ticket to make it look more legitimate. They're responding to those controls, right? To those turnstiles on that arena to say, well, the turnstile is not gonna stop me because I'm just gonna make a better fake ticket. Detection and response, they really go hand in hand, guys. So um, let's say that bad actor was able to present a convincing enough ticket to get past the staff at the door. So once inside, there's gonna be security guards. Um, they're gonna scan the space. They're gonna watch for suspicious activity. A really smart bad actor might try to kind of hide in plain sight uh, by imitating a security guard. And once they had a uniform and a badge, how would we know, right, that they're not a legitimate security guard? So we're applying this methodology to our security. We found that attackers are constantly finding ways around our preventative measures, and we have to find a better way to root them out. Um, if we continue scanning your device, right, looking for suspicious behaviors, like, for example, a file that could be named correctly, but perhaps it's behaving suspiciously, 
we can monitor and then decide if we need to respond before they're able to execute their malicious attack. Um, response involves finding a way to return your systems back to normal. This could be as simple as kicking out that bad actor by removing that malicious software um, and then also looking for any additional bad actions um, that were involved in that attack. Or if that actor has been able to execute their malware, for example, by installing something like ransomware or from stealing data from your systems, like data exfiltration, for example, we need to be able to identify these actions as soon as possible. Um, the sooner that we can identify those actions, the sooner that we can move into response mode, which will help you guys minimize your damage. Then you'd roll out your recovery plan and begin that return to normal. So mitigation is really the name of the game here if we can't stop an attack outright. And what's important for us to remember, um, we need both prevention and detection and response. Um, that's what gives us the best chance at finding attackers. Prevention is a necessary part of your security stack, of course, but recognizing that perfect prevention doesn't exist, right? Having a little bit of self-awareness to say, I know that my security stack is not infallible, um, has to be a part of the equation as well. So once you understand that bad actors are constantly evolving ahead of preventative security tools, it's time to add a detection layer. Um, and it has to be added as an essential part of your security stack, not an add-on, not an option, but an essential response, right, to bad actors being able to evolve around your preventative security. Um, here's another analogy that we like to use here with Huntress, kind of to describe preventative security in general. This is a really great way to describe preventative security to your clients who might not understand that a preventative security stack isn't 100% effective. So it's kind of like fishing with a net. So with each layer of preventative security, with each tool you guys add into your stack, you're shrinking the holes in your net, right? So adding something like AV, AV and firewall will kind of shrink the holes in that net a little further. Adding multi-factor authentication, same thing, you're shrinking the holes in that net so that less, less fish are able to escape. But what will happen is um, no matter how many layers you guys add in your security stack, a bad actor is just gonna engineer a smaller fish. That's really kind of what's going to happen here is that a bad actor will always be able to find a way around your preventative security stack. They're evolving one step ahead of the defenders. And this is why a detection layer is so important. So let's take a moment to kind of look at some of the common preventative measures that we may have in place and how detection response adds that additional layer specifically. So email security is designed to look for known bad actors within your inbox. Um, that kind of starts the cycle of bad actors creating better phishing emails uh, to get around those filters, unfortunately. Um, this fact doesn't negate the need for email security, of course, though, right? There's still a good chunk of spam or phishing emails that get blocked outright, which is a good thing. And then we have firewalls. Um, they filter out dangerous websites. Um, they're definitely very important to protect your office, but that doesn't work when you're not in the office. Um, important piece kind of here in that new work from home or work from anywhere BYOD world that we're facing. And then antivirus is, is a critical step, of course, but that filters out a lot of malicious activity kind of based on the fingerprint of the file. Um, they can compare it against the database of known bad files and immediately stop or quarantine it, which is, you know, the ideal scenario there. But attackers are advancing their trade. They have discovered ways to get around every single layer, right? every single layer of preventative security. And that doesn't mean that we don't need each of these layers because each is important to providing a fully layered security approach. Each layer is going to help you guys minimize your risk of infection. So another completely differentiated layer that you guys should consider adding if you haven't already is a layer of threat hunting. As you guys might remember from Jeremy's presentation, you know, threat hunting is absolutely key here because it's watching how different applications or files are acting. Other layers might let a file that looks like a basic Microsoft application, but you know, it's actually behaving like malware. They might let that stay on a system, but having a security analyst hunt for suspicious activity means that we now have a way to find and remove the bad actors before they have the chance to do much harm. So in order to look for things that slip past your preventative defenses, the first thing that you guys need is visibility. A lot of tools in your network and security stacks, they've got plenty of visibility that could potentially feed into an automation system to help bubble up alerts, but you're still left with a considerable amount of information. 
considerable amount of noise. And that noise now needs analysis by trained security analysts uh, to determine what is the stuff that I should care about? Which of these alerts are important to me? Which of these alerts indicate a threat? And that's where MDR comes in, manage detection and response. So um, kind of stressing on this again, guys, the importance of people. The importance of our threat ops team, which is our team of security researchers that work with us here at Huntress, um, they're a team of trained industry experts. They analyze suspicious behavior and inform context-aware response actions. I, I really can't stress how important this team is to our operations here at Huntress. Um, let's take a quick little walk through why we might need security experts looking at suspicious behavior. So, uh, because it really comes down to context. So for a lot of things in life, context is key. Look at this picture, right? We have a beautiful looking pool with a great diving board. It's a beautiful summer day here in Orange County, about 80 degrees and a dip in this pool sounds awesome, right? But what if I told you that this diving board would have you diving into a pool full of sharks? It's not so cool anymore, of course. So being able to zoom out, to look at the bigger picture and to see context is extremely, extremely helpful. In fact, it's critical for threat hunting. So with that said, you know, we know monitoring the endpoints a really tough job. We've got, you know, all of these layers, but the risk is, is still there. Successful cyber operations, though, they depend on three things, right? If you're a bad actor and you're looking to breach a target, they have to have initial access, they have to have communication, and they have to have persistence. And there's that pesky word again, persistence, right? We keep talking about persistence, persistence, persistence. What can we do to detect this persistence? So for one thing, you can use Huntress. So we specialize in persistent foothold detection, among other things like ransomware, right? Um, this is where our ransomware canaries come in, as Brian had mentioned earlier. We've got exposed ports and services that we can detect through our external recon service. And then we have this managed AV piece as well. This will allow you guys to manage Windows Defender, a really awesome next gen AV, especially if you haven't taken a look at it in the past year or two. It's definitely worth a second look. Um, but it's it's creating a way for you guys to be able to manage this um, for the way that you work as a managed service provider. Um, and while attackers are constantly evolving their tactics, you know, we as defenders, we really want a system, systemic or systematic framework uh, to unpack all that kind of goes into this attack. So the attacker journey of the cybersecurity kill chain, that's a way for us as defenders to codify or categorize how and where to mount our defenses. And this ties into the product as well. So the first step is if I'm a bad actor, right? if I'm putting on my black cap, I wanna first make my way onto the environment. So this is the break-in. This is how attacker you know, manages to break into that device, maintain a presence on that device. It's often through methods like an RDP brute force attack or more often than not a phishing email. Once I'm in, I'm gonna survey the land. So what potential system weaknesses can I, as the bad actor, exploit? What are some easy targets? What are some low hanging fruit items that I can take advantage of so I can maximize my potential damage? After the survey, I wanna put my stake in the ground. So I wanna implant myself into the environment. I wanna make sure I'm difficult to remove. I wanna move laterally. I wanna to try to gain more ground at this stage as well. And as soon as I've landed and kind of planted in that environment, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait for instructions. Sometimes this could be days. Sometimes it could be weeks. Sometimes it could be months. Sometimes it could be years before I receive, before I receive instructions from my command and control. But once I do, what follows? That's go time. Okay. That's when the ransomware hits. That's when potentially data exfiltration will happen. This is the phase that obviously everybody wants to avoid potentially at all costs. Um, while not all attacks are going to take this path, much of the evolution that we see uh, is kind of found within these individual phases. So this is a way for us to, us to kind of help dissect some of the phases of an attack. Even in this kill chain, um, we see ways that other kill chains have evolved uh, over time, just kind of based off of how bad actors are changing. So let's look at step three, that's installation. So that's how the attacker implants themselves in the environment. Once they've slipped past your preventative defenses earlier in the attack, 
They don't want to let go of all of the hard work that they've put in. This is also where most preventative security measures will break down. Um, coincidentally, this is where Huntress shines, right? So imagine creating a phishing email, you add graphics, you spoof a common vendor, perhaps you're spoofing Amazon or eBay, you've created servers, you've created infrastructure to build your malware. This all takes time and effort. Remember, it's a business for these guys, right? For these bad actors. But imagine losing all of your effort to a simple machine reboot <laughs> or your victim logging off, right? All your progress would be lost. It's really unlikely that they're gonna open that phishing email that you sent over to them you know, twice. So instead, you wanna find a way to establish persistence on the machine so you can ride through some of these reset events. So how do we stop this? What can we do about bad actors evolving at breakneck speeds? And the truth is, we really need to find ways to accelerate security adoption, especially in the SMB sector. It's definitely not easy. So how can this multi-tiered approach to solving attacker threats move even faster? So my personal opinion, it's the responsibility of organizations like Huntress. Um, you know, we've also got other subject matter experts in the security space. They have to make, we have to make data readily available. This shortens steps one, two, three, learn, decide, research, and this feedback loop. The next thing that falls on our shoulders is we want to be as proactive and as preventative as possible um, so IT can focus on supporting the daily needs of their clients. And when I say we, that's the MSP, right? For MSPs, you have to implement as many proactive preventative solutions as possible so that you guys can focus on other issues that your MSP faces, other client issues, uh, not just security. Um, and if those things are in place, then MSPs can get through their feedback loop substantially faster and get information to your clients faster. That will help iterate faster so that you guys will have a shot at blocking things when bad actors are moving so, so quickly. So one of the ways that we can help you guys do this is through hunting for footholds. So with Huntress, um, we were looking for persistent footholds on your device. That's one of the four features that we offer here. So what's a foothold? In short, it's an auto run that's been abused by a bad actor in order to maintain persistence. Um, we also call these persistence mechanisms. And of course, right, uh, persistence is when a bad actor has at will access to your device. Uh, they've already managed to breach through that perimeter, gain access to that device, and now they have access to that device via your foothold. Where we're gonna look for these footholds are in Windows components that are configured to automatically run, AKA auto runs. Anything that starts up on your device automatically is what we look at here with Huntress because we know it's a fantastic place for a bad actor to hide their foothold. Um, we look in things like the startup folder, scheduled tasks, run key, and services. So um, how does it work? So you guys would deploy our agent. Our agent is compatible with Windows workstations and servers. Um, we have scripts written for all the major RMM players that are out there. So uh, if you guys are using an RMM, chances are we have a script that will help you guys get deployed. Um, our Huntress agent is also very lightweight. We use less than 1% of your CPU here. Um, we're also product agnostic. So you guys can use Huntress alongside literally any other tool that you guys are using and we won't interfere. So the way that the agent works is once it's on a device, it's gonna collect information via a survey. We run a survey of your device every 12 to 15 minutes or so. If we detect that there's a change to that device. And what we do is we send that information up into our Huntress cloud. And this is the most important piece arguably to the tool. This is where we have our team of security researchers, our threat ops team that investigates those auto runs that we see saying, hey, is this auto run behaving how we normally see this auto run behave? And if it's behaving suspiciously, we'll launch a full scale investigation to figure out what's going on on that device, analyze the context behind what's happening, and then determine if it's distributing some type of malicious attack. Um, if there is malware that's present on that device, and only if there's malware that's present on that device, we'll generate a ticket, right? Right into your PSA system that you guys are using hit or an alert. What this will do is it will inform you a little bit more about what we found so that you guys can take actions to go ahead and get rid of it. And this is an example of what the ticket looks like. So this is a ConnectWise example, but we have integrations with most of the major PSA tools that are out there. 
This will show you first a little bit more about the type of malware that we found. So in this case, it's a PowerShell payload. This one extracts a malicious file in the registry and executes it. This one happens to spread um, a piece of malware call, called Ursniff. It's a banking trojan. It's capable of web browser manipulation, web injections, man in the browser functionality, form grabbing. You know, this is how we normally see this attack behave. And then we got the host information. So this will show you guys uh, you know, which devices we found that infection on. We've got the organization name. This is your customer name. So this will show you, you know, hey, this is present on this customer. We do have a multi-tenant dashboard with Huntress, so you'll be able to manage your clients um, via their own tenant or their own dashboard underneath your master tenant. And then we also have security products, which is kind of fun. We'll show you guys, you know, hey, look, we saw the Cisco umbrella agent, the Malwarebytes agent, WebRoot, and Windows Defender on this device. This is not to knock any of these products at all. Just kind of going back to no preventative security stack is 100% effective. This is just demonstrating that although these security tools were present on this device, we still saw this attack manage to bypass um, you know, those defenses and establish a persistent presence on this device. And then finally, we give you guys the steps that you need to take to remediate. So um, these steps are gonna be written out step-by-step step so that a junior level tech can perform these actions. There's actually no longer a need for you guys to have your tier three techs to be cleaning up sophisticated um, malware incidents, right? You guys can assign this to your tier ones and these instructions will be written in a way that they can understand to be able to go through and get rid of this foothold. Or you guys can push a button and we'll do it for you. <laughs> so um, this is one of the features that we've added um, over the past couple of years, it's assisted remediation button. So this will allow you guys to review a remediation plan that looks something like this, where we'll show you every single step that we have to take in order to get rid of this foothold. And if you hit approve, our agent will be tasked to run these commands for you. So it makes remediation really, really quick. Um, We've even seen self-propagating types of malware, really nasty pieces of malware like TrickBot, for example, be remediated in less than 60 seconds per device. Normally this kind of thing takes days or weeks to clean up. So the time savings there is huge. So um, just like we kind of recommended you guys increasing the tempo of, of your feedback loop with the help of Huntress, we are also following that same advice. So this is, this is kind of how we operate here at Huntress. We're gonna iterate faster to try to stay in lockstep with bad actors as much as possible by pushing solutions that are gonna address the biggest pain points that you guys face at your MSP and that are influenced by how threats are changing. Um, we're also going to be aware of major shifts in IT, like the movement to cloud and SaaS, of course. And then we're also, and most importantly, going to have a fantastic partner community that consistently gives us feedback that we can quickly turn into action. So we're really transparent here at Huntress. You know, we take any and all feedback and we love hearing from our partners on what may be useful for them. And we try to iterate using kind of those priorities in mind. Um, and, and really kind of what I mean by this essentially is we want to create that feedback loop between us and our partners too. So um, we want to be able to capture their needs, their pain, so that we can then deliver solutions that tailor fit to our community of managed service providers so that you guys can continue to do what you best, do best, provide better security for your clients, um, and so that we can direct um, resources to address the problems that you guys face most often or address some of those most challenging problems that you guys might, might face. Okay, so back to our kill chain. Let's jump forward a little bit and look at uh, step five, which is action. So in the majority of cases where we're seeing the most damage to end users is ransomware, unfortunately. Um, action can entail other things like data exfiltration or resource hijacking, but most of what we hear about in the news, most of what your clients will probably be familiar with is ransomware. Um, unfortunately, there doesn't appear to be an end to this type of malware. And in fact, the frequency is increasing year over year. So ideally, we wouldn't want the attack to reach this point, but given how attackers are kind of weaving and, and pivoting their way through the other four phases, addressing this phase, it's really all about early detection um, so that you guys can deploy a fast response. So think about 
if you guys could reduce your downtime when a catastrophic ransomware incident occurs, um, if you could reduce it by a day, if you could reduce it by three days, if you could reduce it by five days, what would that mean to you guys to be able to accomplish this? So one of the ways that we have iterated to help address that specific need and help kind of close that feedback loop is through ransomware canaries. So this is another feature offering that we have here with the tool. What the ransomware canary is, is if you guys are familiar with the concept of a canary in a coal mine, right? Uh, miners used to take down canaries with them into the mines because canaries' lungs were much smaller, much more sensitive to things like carbon monoxide. If something bad happened to the canary, then they'd know to evacuate the mine. I promise no canaries were harmed in the making of our ransomware canaries, right? Um, but what these are going to do is these are going to help you guys um, respond to ransomware faster. So our version of a canary is a deployed file that we would push out via our Huntress agent that sits on your device. What will happen is these files are named and designed to be encrypted first in the case of a ransomware incident. So if any change is made to that file, we send the alarm to our threat ops team and we say, hey, it looks like this file has been altered. Is this ransomware? And our team will confirm if it's ransomware, if it's an active ransomware encryption or not. Perhaps it could be just an end user that's messing around on their device. We see that from time to time. But if it's active ransomware, what will happen is we'll send you guys a critical level Huntress alert. And that will show you guys, hey, we're seeing that there's an encryption that's taking place. We wanted to notify you guys first. Um, and, and one of the coolest ways I think these canaries function is that they're unique to each end user profile. So you guys will be able to tell down to the user profile level who's been hit which is really, really important because if you've ever been through a ransomware incident, you know, trying to find which devices have been hit at a specific client is really, really difficult and it's time consuming at a time when those minutes matter a lot. Um, now these canaries can mean the difference sometimes between, you know, uh, your client calling you at nine o'clock in the morning saying, I can't access anything on my device. And now someone is saying that I need to pay them to get my files back versus you getting an early warning notification of an active encryption, taking the steps that you need to take in order to um, corral that infection and start remediation, and you calling your client at 9 a.m. saying, guys, we were notified early of a ransomware incident that was taking place. Don't worry, we started the remediation last night and you guys should be up and running this morning with no downtime, no problems. That's why we're your trusted IT services provider. Cool, and then next up um, in our feature offering, that's external recon. So um, kind of where this ties back to in the attack kill chain, it's brute force attacks through RDP. They're extremely prevalent based on machines with RDP services or exposed to internet. As a matter of fact, uh, open RDP is the number one way that ransomware will spread to small businesses. It's not phishing, surprisingly, it's open RDP. So um, to give you guys kind of a fun fact here, so we've been tracking external IP addresses that our agent connects out from for quite some time. Um, in the December before you know, COVID hit, we were looking at and analyzing about 30,000 external IP addresses. Um, come March, right, right when COVID was first starting to kind of strike, uh, that number ballooned up to 100,000 external IPs. So it quite literally tripled, maybe not overnight, but real, in really, really short amount of time. So your, your surface that you had to identify and protect, right, um, those assets that you had to identify and protect as an MSP tripled in very short order. So in order to kind of help you guys uh, identify some of those assets, identify some of that low hanging fruit, what we've done is we've put together a service called External Recon. This is a port scanning service. So how it works is if you guys are familiar with Shodan, um, Shodan is a public facing, you know, anybody can access Shodan site where they'll list out um, any exposed or externally accessible ports across the entire internet, across the entire globe. As you can imagine, um, that's a fantastic resource for a bad actor to start their brute force attack, right? Shodan will give them a list of their external IP address. Sometimes they'll do a screen, a screen grab of their login page. So they'll have username information. They'll tell them country of origin. All kinds of information is publicly available when you have something like an open RDP port. 
So what Huntress will do is we'll take our agent, we'll take note of their external IP address that that agent is connecting out from. And what we'll do is we will um, cross-reference that with Shodan to see if any of those IP addresses are showing up as externally available in Shodan. And the goal here is to give you guys some visibility because a lot of times when there's open RDP, right, the SMB or the partner won't be aware that it's open. So what we want to do is we want to give you guys another tool to say, okay, we want to make sure our clients are not showing up on this list that bad actors reference frequently, right, um, and give you guys a little bit more visibility to see when something looks like it's externally accessible. And it's not just open RDP. There's things like open SMB shares or really any open and available port can be a problem if you guys don't have the specific safeguards um, needed kind of on your end to make sure that everything is locked down properly. So this is another really, really cool feature. Um, also, this will help in that kind of work from home environment because we'll be detecting, you know, external IP addresses uh, for agents that are connecting out from home networks or from working from Starbucks or, or what have you, because you're still responsible for, in a lot of cases, securing those assets as well, no matter where that person is connecting from. And this is our Huntress dashboard here. So um, we give you guys a web-based console. So this will show you um, what we've detected. Uh, you can see here, we've got a multi-tenant dashboard. You click this drop down, and it will show you a list of tenants. Um, so you guys can manage each customer on a client by client basis. We also will show you active incidents here in the dashboard with critical level severity, high level or low level severity. We assign a severity to each incident that we send over to you so that you guys can know which incidents you want to go through and clean up first. This can help you guys prioritize your response. And then we've got resolved incidents here. This will show you what you've already cleaned up, of course. And then we have investigations. You guys are going to note we have 81 investigations here, right, and nine malicious incidents. We are not generating 81 PSA alerts for you guys to have to click through. <laughs> We're only generating these nine incidents um, these nine alerts, these nine notifications for you guys, because what we've done is we've taken on the research and the investigation of these threats. That's on our shoulders here at Huntress. That's no longer the responsibility of your team, right? You're essentially outsourcing that research, that analysis to our team of trained threat hunters. And what we're going to do is we're only going to notify you if we've confirmed with a real human that there's something malicious on your device. Um, and, and I should tell you too, guys, one of the most um, positive discoveries that we found as of late, it's that the non-ATP Microsoft Defender, it's, it's actually a top performing AV, um, believe it or not. Um, you know, it, when you're talking about next gen AV, kind of shortening that feedback loop, right? It's, it's really, really important. Even, even this next-gen AV, the Microsoft Defender, that will feed into the feedback loop for ATP, right? That, that EDR service or Microsoft for Endpoints as they're calling it nowadays. So this kind of takes us to what we've spent a lot of time on lately and, and that brings us to our managed AV service. And you guys might be asking, why, why are we even doing managed AV, right? Um, managed AV actually does sit squarely kind of within our mission of streamlining defense here. One of the, guys, one of the things you guys might hear a lot of is pressure around the idea that we're not doing enough when it comes to, when it comes to security, right? Your clients might pressure you, hey, we're not doing enough when it comes to security. You might be pressuring your clients, we're not doing enough when it comes to security. Um, there's always new gaps and tools that can be added to help kind of address those gaps. But there are also a lot of configuration knobs that we can kind of tweak and pull in order to improve security that are completely free. Um, but trying to manage those tools or trying to deploy them, that's where things usually become tricky. So the idea with Manage AV is how can we get the most of the tools that we're already using that we already have at our disposal? And this is really kind of where we come in. So that multi-tenancy portion for managed AV is where we've been focusing. And one of the reasons why we've decided to kind of focus there is, again, if you guys haven't looked at Microsoft Defender, it is a really, really good AV. Uh, we have some third-party AV testing here from a, a service called AV Test. You guys can look up this information on your own, but you'll find Microsoft Defender scores top marks time and time again. It's not just AV Test that's evaluating Defender and giving it top marks. It's one of the best AVs that's out there, believe it or not. 
And when you consider kind of the cost of it, which is built in, of course, with your Microsoft license, this becomes a really, really compelling offering for managed service providers, or at least it would if you could manage it in a multi-tenant capacity. And that's the piece that we've created here with Huntress. So we wanna allow you guys to be able to use this really, really awesome Microsoft Defender service and not have it be a total management headache, so much so that it's really like a non-starter for you guys to use Defender in any capacity. This is the piece that we've created. So this is in beta right now in our Huntress platform. Um, we have partners that are you know, testing out the service that are using it, giving us some feedback on what features they would need to see to make this a third-party AV alternative. But that's really where we want to take this, guys, is we want to be a replacement for your third-party AV through creating multi-tenancy for Windows Defender, because it's a really, really great option, both efficacy-wise and cost-wise, too. Imagine being able to recoup some of those costs that you guys would normally spend on third-party AV. It would be pretty awesome, especially if you're using something like a pricing next-gen AV tool. And I don't know if any of you folks had heard, but there was an exchange server vulnerability back in March. Um, I, I'm sure everybody heard about this one. This was um, obviously a really widespread issue. Um, this is kind of spray and pray as they call it, right? There was a vulnerability here that bad actors were taking advantage of left and right. Um, we were notified of this from an MSP partner of ours. And what we've kind of done, and, and this is a, a testament to how we want to operate as a company, how we do operate as a company, is we spun up um, a ton of research and an alert overnight to be able to detect for this type of a vulnerability. So if you guys follow us on Reddit, you'll know that we did a lot of coverage on the exchange server vulnerability, do a lot of coverage anytime a type of global kind of catastrophic, like a, a vulnerability like this takes place. Um, but what we translated that to, and this is how we kind of iterated and, and how we're staying true to our word here is, we don't normally investigate non-persistent malware here with Huntress, right? With our with our persistent foothold detection focus or without the ransomware canaries. But we knew that we could help here. So what we did was we spun up a feature quite literally overnight once we knew about their exchange server vulnerabilities. And what we did was we actually abused a feature in our ransomware canaries to be able to detect for malicious web shells on client devices. And this is a feature that is present in the Huntress console today. I don't think anyone on our engineering team got any sleep um, that week that the exchange of vulnerabilities came out because we were literally working around the clock to make sure that with such a critical level of vulnerability that we could give you guys as much information as we possibly could, even if it was beyond the scope of our normal product offering. And this really ties into us here at Huntress, the way we operate, because we want to be a partner that you guys are working with rather than just a vendor. As such, we've created a partner enablement services section that's available on your Huntress dashboard. Um, and that's divided into three sections. So we've got mastering Huntress. That includes technical documentation, an onboarding guide, everything you'll need to know to maximize your Huntress experience. We've got growing revenue. Um, this is ready to deliver slide decks, content, white papers, data sheets that you guys can use when selling security to customers and prospects. And then finally, we have gaining knowledge. And this is security education outside of just what we do here at Huntress. And this kind of ties it all in. We don't want to be just another transactional vendor that you guys are working with. We want to actually help you improve your business because we know that a rising tide will lift all ships. So we give you guys the tools that you need to have in order to communicate the value of Huntress to your customers, to make sure that your team is onboarded and prepped for you know, what they'll need to know to use the Huntress console effectively. And then we kind of take it a step further by educating the MSP community community on what we know as security experts. We're communicating some of the lessons that we've learned to the greater community in, in the idea, with the idea that it will help to raise that cybersecurity poverty level. And here's an example of what the Mastering Huntress section looks like. You can see we've got tons and tons of resources here for you to take advantage of in lots of different formats. This is just a sample, but there's quite a bit more here that you guys can use in your Huntress dashboard. And as uh, Jeremy mentioned earlier, so we do offer a trial of the service. So if you guys would like to kick the tires, uh, if you'd like to test the service, it is a 21 day trial or your first three higher critical level incidents. It's whichever comes first. And you guys have access to deploy an unlimited number of agents. 
As a matter of fact, we encourage you guys to deploy out across your client base, across every single endpoint that you guys manage, because what we're looking for here are the needles in the haystack, those needles in the haystack that have bypassed your preventative security stack, right? And to do that, we need to be able to look in every nook and cranny that you guys manage in order to be able to identify those footholds that are designed to go undetected. So we do encourage you guys to deploy out to as many endpoints as you guys manage. If nothing else, we're really easy to deploy, like crazy easy to deploy. Most MSPs can get deployed in less than 30 minutes and it's a one click uninstall, even if you guys decide not to move forward with the service. So it's a very, very minimal risk here involved with the tool, very minimal time commitment. MSPs will use this as essentially like a free security audit, right? To show if there are any gaps that they might've missed and then use that to determine if this is a tool that would provide them with a value. And of course, even if there's no threats that we've detected at that point, there's certainly the chance that something will slip past your preventative security stack in the future. And that's why constant monitoring is important, which is exactly what we do here at Huntress to help you guys detect and respond to threats in a timely manner um, as a way to mitigate the, the, um, the, the infection itself, right? To mitigate it, to help it, stop it from getting worse. So if you guys want to start a trial, you can go to huntress.com forward slash trial. You can also contact me if you have any questions. I'm danielle.painter at huntress.com. Um, I'd be happy to help you guys get set up with a trial account. We can also set you up with a deployment call if you'd like to have one of our engineers walk you through the process. Um, other than that, that's pretty much it when it comes to the, the product, guys. Um, I'd love to open the floor up to questions. Um, I see here that we've got a couple of questions in here. Yeah, great I'll job, Danielle. I think the, the first one there is from Ruben. What is the average time from detected threat to Huntress notification? Awesome. Yeah, so um, that's a great question, Ruben. So when we're talking about the average time to detect, our agent will run a scan of your device every 12 to 15 minutes. So if we see that there's a change on that device, what we'll do is we'll run a scan and say, okay, you know, things look normal on this device or maybe something is behaving suspiciously. If something is behaving suspiciously, it takes about five minutes to send that information up into our Huntress cloud. Now, this is kind of where we go one of two ways. If we've seen this attack behave in this way before, it's a very quick process for us to be able to identify what type of malware it is and how you guys should go in and clean it up because we've likely seen it on another partner before. So that's one of the benefits of working with us here at Huntress is that we're working with about 1800 managed service providers. So chances are, if we've seen an attack on one of their devices, you know, we can easily and more quickly identify it on your devices should that time ever come. Right, so that's one way. The other way is if it's something that's totally new to us here at Huntress, we've never seen it before, right? Um, or perhaps it's got, you know, zero day type tendencies, right? Perhaps it's new just in general. Um, that's something where we're, we're going to require a little bit more investigation, and that can be a bit more open-ended. So, you know, that process is in-depth. Our security research team will spin up a virtual machine. What they'll do is they'll evaluate what's happening on, on that device, and if they determine that the actions that are being performed are malicious, that's when we would generate a ticket. So that one's a little bit more open-ended because it does require so much research, right? Sometimes those will go quick, you know, half an hour, an hour. Sometimes they'll take, you know, 24 hours. It really just depends on the type of malware that we're seeing. But you can figure in most cases, we'll be able to generate an alert for you guys in about, you know, less than 30 minutes or so. I was all set with a question, Danielle. And then the chat started to fill up. <laughs> By the way, my question wasn't for you. It was for, for my peer group members that are on here to say, who wants to be the one to sign us up for Huntress? Because I think we need to put this on all our machines. And then all those Mac questions came up. <laughs> yeah. I got shot down already. But uh, so when you guys are ready, I will have one of our members, at least uh, that's already working with you, or maybe one that isn't and tell them they need to start so that we can start monitoring our systems. Awesome. Yeah. And, and the Mac question, we get to ask that one quite a bit in this day and age, you know, progressively more and more. 
Um, so we do have, as Jeremy mentioned, we've got an alpha of the MAC agent. Um, we are actively working on that and we do expect to have a Mac agent out to you guys soon because right now we're Windows only. You'll want to put us on Windows workstations and servers, but we know that there's a growing community of Mac users out there. So we're working on it. We've, we've definitely gotten that feedback and that's something that's um, on our roadmap. Yeah, and I was told just yesterday it was slated for Q4. That can always push, but the alpha is slated to be available Q4. And I dropped a link in there. We use a, a feature call or a service called Canny for our feature request systems, which is pretty cool. So if you're a current partner and you haven't seen that yet, check it out and peruse all the feature requests or add one that you need but haven't seen on there. But if you add yourself to the Mac OS support feature and you can either just uh, upvote or add a comment, when that becomes available, we'll be reaching out to everybody who is in that thread. And we, we really do listen to that feedback, guys. So upload any and all features that you'd like to see with the Huntress console. It's a direct line to not just our product managers, but also our founders at Huntress. They're constantly combing that page to figure out, right, from, from the top of the mountain to try to figure out where we should, you know, steer the ship next. So feel free to add anything that you guys see or, or upload anything in, that you guys think might be useful to have uh, in the offering there too. Um, I'm not sure if we're, we're collecting um, folks for the alpha. I can double check for you, Corey, though. Um, I'll, I'll see if there's a list that we have in place uh, for folks that want to test out the alpha when we make that available. Okay, guys, does anyone have any more questions? Um, anything else that I can answer about the Huntress offering, the agent, the trial? Um, if there's nothing else, oh, what, what's Huntress plans for cloud services, AWS, Azure, O365? Um, we're not really sure quite yet. So that's another thing that if you guys would like to see our services, um, you know, with Azure O365 management, um, add that to Canny. I know that there's a feature request in there for O365 now. So go ahead and upload that if that's something that you guys would like to see. Jeremy, you might have a little bit more to add to that. Only that I know, and, and Danielle has heard the same that I have, Kyle has talked about that. Like that is something that is on our radar. That is something we want to do. Uh, and we are figuring out how to appropriately get into that space, keeping with our mission of like, we want to catch the things that get by everything else. We want to add value in the space. So it's going to take some, uh, some research and development there, but it is something we're looking at for sure. And John may, he's not in his head, maybe he knows a little more, but it, we're going to kick it over to him pretty soon anyway. Yeah, that's, that's true. So we've definitely discussed that as a team. Um, we're just not exactly sure the route that we want to take just quite yet. So nothing on, uh, unfortunately concrete to offer you guys there, but just know that it is an active topic of discussion with us internally. Um, are we planning to expand our MDR offering to other uh, vendors other than Microsoft? Um, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say, most likely not. And Jeremy, John, keep me honest, right? But the reason why we have decided to partner or to integrate with well, Microsoft. Are you talking, I guess the clarification of MDR being like persistent footholds or the Microsoft Defender piece? Uh, Cause I think the path you were taking, Danielle, the, the correct one of we will be partnering with Microsoft Defender for the managed AV piece. I doubt others, but our MDR that Mac agent being in under development means that the MDR piece will be available across multiple operating systems. So, okay. So thanks. Yeah. For yeah, that's a good point. So take it away, Danielle. <laughs> yes. Yep. No, that makes sense. Yep. So I, yeah. So I was making an assumption there as managed JV. Thank you, Jeremy, for, for correcting. Cause if, uh, if that was going nope, other way, you're right. You're right. The question at all. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so with the managed JV piece, we're likely not going to be, um, working with other vendors and there's a couple reasons for that. So one, um, we asked ourselves, how can we deliver a solution, um, to help our MSPs, at scale, right? How can we help the most MSPs um, as quickly as possible? And the easiest way to do that, the quickest way to do that was to incorporate an integration with Microsoft Defender because Microsoft Defender is on literally every Windows box. And since we're a Windows only agent at this point, right? Every box will be have, have some capacity of Defender on that device. So that was the way for us to kind of get out an integration as quickly as possible. Um, you know, the other reason there and, and a really, really important reason is that we saw Defender improving a lot 
right? A lot, a lot over the past couple of years. And we got the complaint from our partners, oh man, Defender is getting better, but we just can't use it. I, I just can't manage this on a per endpoint basis. It's a non-starter for managed service providers. I mean, imagine that. Wait, headache. Danielle, you're telling me Microsoft hasn't figured out multi-tenancy for MSPs? I know. This is the first I'm hearing of this. <laughs> Shocking. They seem to have it nailed in teams, right? I mean, it's perfect in teams. It's just, it's, it's one of those things where they're not quite there yet. And that's putting it nicely, right? And they're a long ways away. So, um, they haven't really figured out how to work with managed service providers. It's something we see with larger companies all the time, right? Um, and that's one of the features that we knew that we could implement because we already had a product that offered multi-tenancy. So it just made a lot of sense for us to be able to combine forces there to say, let's take our multi-tenant infrastructure and this awesome next-gen AV that is, I mean, incredibly cost-effective and kind of combine that to make an offering that would both help MSPs in terms of efficacy and value, right? Or, or help in terms of efficacy and economics, right? Because if you guys can replace your third-party AV with a tool that you're already using, right? Or already have installed on the device, that's actually a fantastic tool. It's really a win-win. Um, so those are kind of the two primary reasons why we're not actively looking at this point, right, to, to work with any other AV vendors there. Exactly. We're trying to let you work with maybe a couple fewer vendors and get the same value or more value out of your security budget than uh, just trying to like, it, I see Carrie's comment of silence, having us manage silence not saying anything about the tool, but uh, that means you are at a, depending on what you're paying for silence and what version of silence, but you're now at like a nine or $10 solution instead of using the embedded Microsoft def uh, Defender that takes it down to whatever you're just paying for Huntress since you've already paid for the Microsoft licenses. So, right. So, but uh, carry five bucks, would that be silence and uh, the cost of Huntress together? Or is that just what you're paying for silence? Okay, cool. So you're at a five buck solution instead of a like 250 solution or a $2 solution. And then being able to take that extra three bucks and send, adding DNS filtering and adding like some other pieces, spreading that uh, to more layers, which layered security is the only way to do security properly. Agreed. Agreed, guys. So thank you so much for the discussion. Um, really appreciate the chance to present here to you guys. Love working with the Ignite groups. Um, so what we're going to do now is if and nobody else has any other questions, if you, I mean, if you do, feel free to drop them in the chat. We'll be around for John's presentation as well. With that, um, I'd love to pass it over to John, because if you guys ever wondered what goes on on our threat ops team or wondered what it was like to be a security analyst, John's going to show you how he dissects malware and coming from someone that's a senior security engineer here at Huntress, it's, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> so with and John, without John, I'll pass it to you. John, before you get going, everybody on the call, this is where you mass text message, all of your texts and say, hop on, <laughs> let's learn together. So I hope this participant number is going to go up, get your texts in involved here and we'll, let's all learn from John. Yeah, now we're done with all of the boring product stuff, guys. Now is when the real fun happens. <laughs> well, hey, how's it going, everybody? Thanks so much. Uh, I appreciate you uh, passing the baton, Danielle. Uh, I realize I am kind of the, the caboose here. <laughs> so uh, coming and following up after uh, Danielle and Jeremy, these are big shoes to fill, but we'll try it. Uh, in this case, I want to showcase the presentation, uh, Teach Your Text to hunt and going beyond the dashboard. Uh, so as our friends kind of alluded to, we're going to get nerdy. <laughs> we're going to get technical. This is a, I don't know why we decided to wait till the end to, to bludgeon you guys over the head with code and real computer stuff, but uh, I hopefully this will be fun. I, I hope we can, we can still kind of get something good out of this. So I have to start off right with the obligatory agenda and outline like, oh, here's the roadmap for kind of what I'd like us to be chatting about for this. Uh, I, I tried to come up with a little cheesy uh, subtitle for each section here. Can you guys see the screen and everything? Audio is all good, by the way, before I dive in. Cool. 
loud and clear, buddy. Awesome. Awesome. I didn't, I didn't hear anyone say no. So, <laughs> so first I want to kind of set the stage. I want to get some foundational like lingo and concepts and ideas out and about, and then we'll get into the weeds, right? Then we'll get into some malware case studies. We'll get into a little demo and it should be a lot of fun. We'll get to light off some fireworks, but First, let's talk about rats, fish, and fancy bears, cobwebs in the corner, or how hackers hide, and then we'll chat about malware. Uh, we'll end it with sort of the, the moral, the thesis, the takeaway, and we'll open it up for question and answers. But I think the best way to segue into kind of the introduction here for rats, fish, and fancy bears to actually zoom in a little bit more on that huntress origin story and i'll be super quick here i'll, I'll be brief because i know everyone wants to get to kind of the fireworks right the cooking show magic uh but i think this is an interesting story and honestly maybe it it's a little close to home that i i hold this near and dear because uh this is the cyber guard and cyber flag exercise uh these are military training and military exercises that were put on by the department of defense and u.s cyber command where you would have like computer people, right? All of us hackers, all the security researchers and security professionals, the blue team, kind of the good guys, the defense, the protectors there, they were pitted up against the red team. It was a red v blue or blue versus red training exercise. And the red team are the bad guys. They're the attackers, they're the hackers. And in this case, they called it the opposing force or op four, kind of that cool military slang, right? Uh, so I, I actually attended Cyber Guard and Cyber Flag in about 2017 and 2018. I don't know. You can see the Coast Guard guy in the back there. He's one of my team leads. Uh, but the reason I bring this up is that when we were chatting about, hey, kind of our founders, <laughs> and you saw Kyle, that, you know, kind of a, a cool Hot Wheel guy that's doing really leet stuff in the Air Force. So he attended Cyber Guard and Cyber Flag. And that kind of like lit the spark for what Huntress came to be. Because when Kyle and when his team were playing and working in this military exercise, Cyber Guard and Cyber Flag, Kyle and his team crushed it. Like they did awesome. <laughs> they, they would have a daily debrief with the red team, right? With the opposing force. Uh, and they'd always start this conversation. How'd you guys find us? How'd you guys know where we were? You, you literally stopped just about all the malware or any persistence that we'd had. And they kind of talked about this idea. They were hunting. They were actively looking for the bad guys, right? They weren't just kind of sitting idly and waiting for their computer to shut off or anything crazy. The way that they did this was actually a smarter rendition of tools that you might already be familiar with, right? Some of you might know the Syst internals suite or some of the Microsoft tools that can help you look at kind of pertinent information and, and stuff happening on your computer. System information or on the internal sys internal suite. One of the pretty awesome utilities included in that suite is looking for auto runs, right? And we, we, we already talked all about these, these auto runs, but that turned out to be the most effective way to see where the enemy was and to track down the opposing force. That was kind of the secret. And Kyle and his team thought, and Kyle had this idea in his head, like, what if we did this at scale? Because we're looking at auto runs with this sys internal suite, this auto runs program, but we're just looking at that on one computer. Uh, how are we going to do this across an entire enterprise when we've got like hundreds of thousands of agents and, and endpoints to work against? It becomes a bigger problem, right? It's harder to do, but that's the basis of how we could hunt and look for these auto runs. So this, I think, it is a gem. If I if I might show you this, um, this is a Huntress Lab GitHub repository, and this repository in this repo is called Puck, or Proof of Concept. So if you look back at kind of the code commits and everything that they were writing to develop this proof of concept for what Huntress came to be. This is stuff from like five or six years ago. Uh, the nerds in the room, uh, it's a Python utility, right? The original Huntress agent was written in Python. I, I appreciate that. I'm a Huntress fanboy myself. But 
I think this is kind of interesting. It's kind of cool. A little gem, a little history on that origin story of Huntress. It would look for auto runs and scheduled tasks and services and these implants and back doors, the persistence that malware or hackers would end up using to remain and access their machine, their target. The question was, was this really going to be that effective? Like, sure, we, we, we put it in this kind of exercise. We put it in this game. Uh, is that just a simulated environment? Is that just a little playground sandbox? What malware really persists? Oh, well, hey, turns out a lot of them, like <laughs> practically all of them, right? So it was incredible to see really the success of this. And that laid the foundation for Huntress main stage event, hunting for persistent footholds. Because just about every security threat, every attack, it leaves behind fingerprints in some way. Whether it's the artifacts that it leaves behind when it maybe touches a file or does something on the file system, or those implants, those back doors, that persistence that the bad guys could use to maintain access. That is the gist, right? Rats, phishing, fancy bear, all whatever APT, whatever threats you might imagine, persistence is still part of the equation. And it's almost a given. So how do hackers hide then? Well, if these auto runs and these persistence can help us track them down, what do they do to pull out all the stops, right? What tricks do they have up their sleeve that make this harder for us? So again, just kind of want to break down some concepts, some ideas. Uh, how do hackers hide? Well, if they have this auto run or this service or this startup task or whatever, uh, is that just going to live in a vacuum? Is that just there without context? Well, no. The hackers still kind of want to operate and interact on that victim. Maybe they deface the website or they drop ransomware, or they steal information or make the computer do strange things, become part of a botnet, all these crazy, crazy things. That's done through command and control, or just the idea, hey, this is how the hacker can use and abuse that computer that they've gained access to. A lot of times we chat about that in the idea of post-exploitation. Like, okay, you have your cyber kill chain, and now the bad guys have broken in, they have initial access, they've taken control of a computer or a machine. Now what do they do? That's the post-exploitation. That's their actions on objectives, whether it's gonna be defacing the website, crypto mining, et cetera, et cetera. One interesting thing you could do here, right? If, if you're checking out, again, that sysinternal suite, oftentimes this means it's gonna be an external callback or they have to reach out or, have some means for the bad guys to be able to take control of the computer, right? So TCP view is one worthwhile and useful utility there in that sys internal suite. And maybe you could use to track down, are there any weird connections to my computer right now? Uh, are, are any of those ports that shouldn't be open? Are they actually open and listening? Are they active? Well, hey, external reconnaissance might be able to help out with that. But then that's how the hackers could work. That's how they can continue their operations. But again, how are they hiding? Where do these auto runs and services and scheduled tasks, all this stuff, where does it live? Well, one place we could check it out is in the Windows registry. And again, for kind of the nerds in the room, it's a big, big, big dictionary or kind of a collection of configuration settings for your computer. And I'm sure I'm sure a lot of you are already pretty familiar with that, right? But it uses hives and keys and values. And that is a treasure trove for where hackers could kind of hide or where data might be able to lurk, hiding in those corners and crevices right of a computer system. The thing is, the registry is like massive. <laughs> so sometimes it can be hard for a human to kind of know the ins and outs and to go understand where to go and where to look. but. Maybe if we're monitoring that, if we're keeping an eye on what happens within the registry or those specific locations for, again, all those auto runs, that could be something worthwhile. And then kind of the most important part here is that 
the way that the hackers are going to execute code, the way that this malware actually takes place is that they're using something native and inherent to your computer. They're using a language, a programming language and code that will inherently execute. It's native to your Windows operating system. So there's some common ones for this, right? Some of us are probably super familiar with PowerShell, right? And that is insane in the amount of attacks that have been using PowerShell kind of lately and in the past year. Batch scripts, of course, some of us that might kind of harken back to the old school cmd.exe or DOS, the disk operating system. Back in those days where you had these, these script files, a .bat script or a .com or .cmd, where you could run commands in the command line, but you could just bundle them up all together in a script file like batch, et cetera. There are also some other oddballs. There's some weird ones like Visual Basic Script or JScript. Uh, JScript is actually really interesting. Uh, sometimes if you happen to take a look at it, if you look at the code and the syntax that makes up that language, it looks almost identical to JavaScript. JavaScript being kind of a more web browser or web oriented language that works on client side code. Uh, but JScript is Microsoft's kind of version or their own dialect for JavaScript. JScript is kind of a, a Microsoft specific rendition of it. But that one's really interesting because you don't always tend to look at the Visual Basic script or JScript or they might not be as common, right, as PowerShell, but it can still run. It can still execute inherently on that target. Just clicking on the icon, it runs code. Other examples are HTA files or hypertext or the HTML applications in Windows. Those are also common and used for a lot of different techniques and attacks. But the ones that we might be the most familiar with are just regular .exe files or programs, right? You think of Word, Microsoft Word and MS Word.exe, or even the calculator or the notepad application. Those are compiled binaries, compiled programs. That means that us as human beings, we can't easily look and see what it's made out of because it's all ones and zeros or represented in assembly or maybe machine code, those instructions and opcodes that tell the computer what to do. That's very different from all the others, right? A PowerShell script or a batch script. Those are scripting languages when the .exe might be a compiled program. That means that it requires different analysis. Uh, so we certainly do a lot with all of these different kinds of files and executable code on with Huntress. EXE files, they're pretty common. And maybe it's going to be a .NET object, kind of a managed code written in C Sharp or some other language or DLLs. But sometimes we'll have to open up Ida Pro or Ghidra or another disassembler and decompiler and get really in the weeds. Um, interestingly enough, though, those scripting languages like that PowerShell or Visual Basic script, those are super common for malware because it's kind of a little stub. Like you could have an extremely short file that will call out to another external server reach out to some other domain and pull down a larger payload or maybe the next stage or the next layer of the malware to run. So those tiny, tiny files that might just be a simple PowerShell script or a simple Visual Basic script, we see those all the time. But it's an, another interesting ballgame, right? When you see those, when you see those kind of small stub or scripting language ones, because they're human readable, because they aren't a compiled program, well then how is the hacker gonna kind of hide what they're doing? How are they gonna mask or kind of disguise what this code might do if it's going to be something that a regular human can just look at? Well, they'll obfuscate it. They'll mess around with the variables, the letters and the symbols and the characters to make it look like utter nonsense. I have the tagline here, it's making sense, not make sense. So it just looks like garbage. 
obscure, unintelligible, or unclear. And the reason they do this is for one, sure, to stop us human analysis, but it's also to really mess up the automated analysis, like your antivirus product or your EDR. If it's just a machine that's going to take a look at this file, oh, well, it just looks like a bunch of weird random letters. Whatever. It's just data. It's nothing that immediately tells me, oh, invoke Mimi Cats or oh, start off Cobalt Strike. It's just a tiny little stub. So your automated solution might go on its merry way and it doesn't take a second look. So these obfuscation techniques, they kind of have dual purpose. Make stuff messy and nonsense, but also slip by some automated utilities. Now this could be done kind of, as I mentioned, those cheesy techniques of just using random letters or random capitalization, maybe encoding or encrypting the data so it's represented in a different way. Or even more common, kind of chunk and, and layer out pieces of the malware, pieces of the payload in separate disparate parts. We see that all the time. And that makes it kind of a fun rabbit hole <laughs> in a weird way. I've got, I've got the uh, Matryoshka dolls up in here where you just take one piece after the next and you're unpeeling the layers of the onion to find really where's the bad stuff. So eventually we get to this idea of, hey, no one's immune to this, right? If we still see flaws and sometimes detection, sometimes prevention, we know no matter how much we keep screaming from the rooftops, users are still going to click on links. Phishing emails are still going to come through. We're still going to have vulnerable software and things can still be exploited. All right. We got to just throw our hands in the air and assume compromise, assume we've already been breached. It's not a matter of if, oh, are, is a hacker really going to target us? Are we really going to be that high value crown jewel that some bad guys want? No, it, it, don't think that way. It's not a matter of if, will I get hacked? It's a matter of when and how do we respond to that? But those initial access techniques, phishing and those server side exploits, Sure, that might be the very, very start of the siege of the campaign, but the persistence, that's what's going to just naturally happen next. It's almost like it's part, it's actually baked in to that initial access. It's part of the automation as to how they might break into the machine. So now let's talk about some of those, right? Now we'll get nerdy. If you're still with me, I don't know if I put anyone to sleep yet, but the malware case studies we can dive into. These are the things that we would see kind of as part of the threat ops team at Huntress. You got our dashboard, which you've seen plenty before uh, and, and kind of our other, present, other presentations here. But this is one infection report that I wanted to bring to your attention because I think it's an interesting story. We'll, we'll sample just a few of these and, and then I can show you something for real. If, you'll, if you're bearing with me there. I like this report here. Hunters detected the following malware on one of your managed hosts, Novter malware. And you heard me right, that, that's actually not Covter. Some of you might be familiar with Covter, but believe it or not, there is a Novter malware. And this is an HTA file, one of those kind of languages that we suggested earlier, the hypertext application. And it's gonna start malicious PowerShell, and then really kick off the malware. So, hey, we suggest you, you know, clean your host. Uh, you've got our assisted remediation kind of ready to roll for you. But you might be wondering if, if you're that inquisitive, curious analyst, if, if you're trying to learn how to hunt, right? Teach your text to hunt. What did that file look like? What were really, what were really up against? What slipped by those security products there? It was this. <laughs> that was our HTA Novter malware file. So I think this is a fine example of obfuscated code, right? You might look at this and say, what am I looking at? Random letters, right? Weird capitalization. It's just insanity. So us over on the threat ops team, we're kind of curious, hey, what's this really made out of? How does this work? What makes this tick? 
So we look at the file, we kind of beautify it, clean it up, make sense of the logic in the code, adding new lines, kind of understanding the logic branches of if statements and loops and uh, catching exceptions, et cetera. Eventually, we're able to walk this through multiple stages, kind of, as I said, chunking it up into different parts, the layers of the onion here. So the HTA application, that original stager, it's heavily obfuscated, but it would pull in more code from the Windows registry. It would execute that, that was JScript. Again, that, that JavaScript dialect that we saw. <laughs> and that HTA file that would then call JScript, then called PowerShell. And then PowerShell loads another registry value that calls something else. <laughs> So eventually, after four, five stages in, we reach more code that's a little bit more human readable. We actually see kind of indications of C-sharp code where we can access more of the Windows internals call uh, Win32 API calls. So we could do spooky stuff like allocate memory or load arbitrary libraries and DLLs, maybe mark some memory sections as readable or writable or executable, and then create a thread to execute shell code or run more bad malicious code. So we're at that point where we can pretty clearly say, hey, that's a bad thing. Uh, we can dig through this code even more, and this is significantly longer. This screenshot here is just a small excerpt. It goes in to do crazy stuff between reflectively loading other power pick extensions and uh, more bad things. I won't bludgeon you over the head with that, but we were able to come to the point where we can do our own detective work, get the research and say, this is Novter, this is malware, and we're going to let you know. Other stuff, and I'll, again, I'll, be try, I'll try to be quick on this one, but this is actually kind of pertinent to what we had seen for Microsoft Exchange. So if you were with us for Exchange Marauder, uh, that was quite a storm, right? I think that that shook up the security industry for quite some time. And we tried to be in the front of it because we had managed AV, right? We had Defender kind of up at arms and we saw one really interesting alert that Microsoft Defender had blocked some spooky PowerShell. PowerShell had base64 encoded command here that if you were to decode it, it would download something from this domain P est09.com. Uh, that IEX means invoke expression. So it'll go ahead and execute that code, whatever came from that website. And if we were to download that, it's another, another PowerShell stager. Loads in more code that could be compressed and encoded in some way. Working through that stage, then we can look through and see what else does this do? So we see something that might, oh, retrieve the MAC address of the target or the victim that this landed on. Uh, maybe it'll grab the current date. So if it were to download anything else, it won't have to deal with the caching of the web browser. We wanna see, hey, what antivirus product is in there? What's the version of this operating system? And then we try to download something new. This is from uh, cdn.chatcdn.net, an, another domain name. And it'll grab maybe a, a high, I think, or low, H-I-G, HIG for high, a little abbreviated there. But we were to download it, decode it from base64 again, and maybe add a scheduled task. This is adding a uh, win it that will run every 45 minutes as a system user with again, encoded code, running scheduled tasks to schedule that. Now we could keep following this over and over and over again. Um, as you were to take a look at that code that the chat CDN domain might give us, it would reach out to yet another, this time an IP address 188.166. And it's interesting, they actually called this a PNG file it is not an image file, just one trick up their sleeves to try and hide it. That's going to be more PowerShell code to run. Layers and layers of obfuscation. Then we do a little bit of research. 
we say, has anyone else seen this? Are, are we the only ones seeing this sort of thing? And it's interesting because even in a, during exchange, when we were seeing web shells left and right, this post exploitation that would tend to follow from it, they there's already been some kind of conversations about it back in 2019. Uh, I think we ended up sort of dubbing this Sapphire Pigeon that was a uh, through some conversations with Red Canary, but interesting. And we of course need to now go see how we can help the industry. Like, hey guys, we see these domains, chat CDN and PS09 and whatever IP addresses. Uh, I see that's on DigitalOcean being hosted on that infrastructure. I see it's a domain registered under Namecheap. So, hey, let's just reach out, let them know, hey, something's hosting malware right now. Can We, we, we got to bring this down. Please take this down. That's just part of the process. But when we start to follow through from the original domain to the second to another, eventually those payloads that we would have came from it are Mimi Cats and Cobalt Strike. Uh, now, Mimi Cats will look for passwords and credentials and memory. Cobalt Strike will again even allowing for more damage and carnage to come through. But that original stub that came from, if I were to go all the way back, and excuse me for just walking through here, this simple PowerShell line of innocent base 64, some automated antivirus is not going to know that thing. It, they're not going to have any idea what to do with this. But if we were to drill down and work through all of these stages, once we find Mimi Cats and Cobalt Strike, you can see some damaging stuff. You kick that over to virus total or whatever else that might be able to scan it other online reversing labs or anything you might like that lights up at a, like a Christmas tree, right? 55, maybe 60 detections out of 70, because we were able to carve through all those segments where the original stub that landed on your computer. Hey, we're none the wiser. That's the real value in analyzing and digging through some of the stuff. So let me be super quick. Let me show you a, a really quick one that hopefully we can kind of press the I believe button if you'd like, but I'll, I'll talk about kind of everything that we were already discussing. I have this uh, Windows 10 virtual machine right here. And now once I were to open up maybe sys internals on this machine that I do have installed, I'm just navigating over in my file system to where I have sys internals and all of these different utilities that we could use. But again, I'm only looking at one specific host, one specific computer. Sure, let's just check out the auto runs. I'll, I'll run the 64-bit version and things will start to populate here. Now, I know this is kind of tiny. I know this is kind of small. I don't know if anyone's able to see anything that might stick out. I don't know if anyone notices anything that's kind of spooky. Anything that's suspicious. If anyone wants to throw it in the chat, that'd be awesome. Get some engagement here, but we'll see if anyone's still awake. This one sticks out to me. Here is a uh, strangely named update.js file. And again, that's one of those JScript files. This is in my app data roaming Microsoft Windows start menu program startup. <laughs> so it's an auto run. It'll kickstart and just detonate right as I turn my computer on the same way Skype might open up or Microsoft Teams might open up. But in this case, it's malware. It's bad stuff. Well, how do we know? We could go take a look. We could hunt and hunt it down. Go see what, it, what it's really made out of. So I'll admit, uh, I have this JScript file kind of moved over to a different virtual machine, something that I might want to use for analysis. So I'll bop out of Windows here and I'll move over to Linux. Personally, I'm a Linux guy. That's, that's just me. I don't know if anyone else happens to be kind of working in that zone, but I'll go ahead and open up a command line because again, <laughs> I'm a nerd, I like the command line. So I'll move into a demonstration directory where I have this file, po9098update.js. 
Let's take a look at what that thing really is. I'm going to open it up in a text editor. Again, it is a J script file. So we know that it should be a scripting language, human readable. So it's this. There's a interesting couple of comments here. Maybe some, some guy saying, hey, I wrote this coded by whatever hacker handle, uh, an update version back in 2020. And it's got this string here, update of VJ worm version 0.1 and WSH rat. Uh, that, that one wasn't pulling out any stops. They, they went ahead and told us maybe what this thing is right away. But if you notice here on the right-hand side, I kind of have like a, a site map or what's really present in this file. And I'll turn word wrap on because you can see there's a lot of nonsense, <laughs> a lot of absolute insanity that we can't make any sense of. And if I scroll down, there's like, 600 lines of this. It goes on and on and on and on and on. At the very bottom, I see some weird code do some other interesting stuff, maybe defining out other variables or other strings that it might use. And it actually will try and index or work with elements of that list compared to what was in all of that yellow nonsense up above. But it does something with it sets it equal to some value, and then it runs this eval function, which is bad. <laughs> eval could very well be execute, right? Or invoke expression. That means it will run more code on the fly. And now that's how hackers use the kind of that buzzword of, of fileless malware, where, oh, we have other stages of code to run, but that's not gonna touch disk. Only the very, very simple stub will touch disk and that, that won't get triggered by antivirus, but maybe the, the later payloads will, kind of as we saw in, in that previous example. So if I were to work with this, part of me wants to know, what does this code really do? Like these yellow arrows and this absolute nonsense isn't real code. Like we, we know that that's garbage. So how can I work with it? There were a lot of strings in that. There were a lot of long lines. So I could try and run strings on this to see if I could make sense of it. Uh, strings is a utility that will look for plain text English letters or, or printable characters that might be present in a file. This is really good to use on like binary programs because if you're looking at a real application, maybe there are some other hidden messages or things that might be present that are used without the code. If we're looking at a, plain text script, strings should return the contents of that script because it's already going to be plain text and human readable. Problem is, in this case, we get nothing, which was originally really weird to me because we're looking at the thing. <laughs> I see the plain text strings right there in the text editor. If you wanted to get kind of low level, kind of nerdy, you could look at the raw binary like bytes and the values there. I'll open the file up in a hex editor. And I notice over on the right hand side, you can kind of see the representation. Oh, I start to see the coded by and that person's name or the update in there and in there. But there are these periods kind of in between it or like dots between the letters. These are all actually null bytes looking at the hex dump. So the zero, zero there. And that's a kind of a problem when you're using encoding schemes. The way data is represented or the way letters and actual characters are displayed in your computer. If I were to check out what this file really is, it's using a UTF-16 encoding, which is not normal. For regular plain text scripts or code like this, we would usually expect a UTF-8. So the, the actual binary bytes, uh, those are actually going to have eight bits rather than 16. So I thought, we need to fix this. We need to change this. The way we could do that is by simply converting it. And I'll, I'll use a simple tool, DOS to Unix, to do that. Uh, if you'd like, you can kind of press the I believe button here, but 
that will go ahead and convert this UTF-16 file back to UTF-8 for that encoding. Now, if I were to take a look at the file in the Sublime Text Editor, just how I was viewing it before, nothing has really changed, but the encoding is very different. If I were to open up that hex editor one more time, those zeros or those periods or those dots aren't in the way anymore. That means that running strings, I'll have all the output be displayed. Okay, cool. That gets one thing out of the way, but how do we make sense as to what this thing is and what it's doing? Well, since it's a scripting language and since JScript is a variant of JavaScript, we could actually just maybe modify the code and nerf out the segment that says execute or detonate more bad code. What if I would replace that eval with just a simple console.log? So it would display out the rest of the code that we seemingly would understand would follow after it did all these calculations and things. We knew that eval that was here previously would have expected legitimate code. So let's not let it run it, but let's just display that following code out and about. Now, because I'm on Linux, um, I'm gonna be able to run something with Node or Node.js, which allow me to execute server-side JavaScript. Uh, and again, because this is JScript, maybe JScript will do some things like create active X objects or really Windows specific stuff, but we don't have to worry because I'm on, Linda, I'm, I'm on Linux right now and that won't detonate, it won't really run. And we've nerfed out the part that will actually execute the code. So just from our own safety, we're trusting of the fact because we know, we look through it ourselves, all that output, once I run it, gives me the next stage here. So I'll redirect that out to, I guess, a stage two dot JSON or, or JS here. And viewing this, we have much, much more readable code. Other strange comments or other notes. Oh, recoder, here's the guy's Skype or whatever. Uh, but we can see right away, here's a host and port that this malware or this rat might call out to. Uh, here are public variables that might be used or private variables. And then the code start or whatever the loop might actually go ahead and run and do. This one function install is super interesting because that actually installs the application as persistence. So when I, when I meant to say earlier where, hey, the, the actual initial access or the execution of code on your program, on your computer, that will automatically install the persistence. It just follows suit. It's just a natural takeaway from what the hacker or the malware might actually do. And they have these weird kind of custom C2 functionality. Like, oh, if they sent the command to disconnect, it'll close the program or to reboot the computer or shut down the computer, execute more code or run password grabbing uninstall things, upload and download things, start a key logger, crazy, right? Law, all this functionality is, is built into this code. And I'm on line, what, 142 right now when we're looking at that install function. If I jump all the way down to the bottom of this, we've got, ooh, okay, 645 that all started from that simple strange stub there. A lot of interesting code, but again, I won't bludgeon you over the head with it. <laughs> I think we've done enough nerdy stuff for now. I don't know. But I think that goes to show. I hope it demonstrates just one quick analysis thing that you can do on your own, that anyone can do. You kind of takes a little bit of know-how, right? It takes a little bit of understanding the syntax and knowing the languages that might be working on that computer. But how does this act as a distinction between what we normally do, right? What about traditional security? What, what's the whole thesis and the, the takeaway that John's getting at here? Well, the thing with traditional security is over here on the left, maybe you have that automated security tool and that's it. 
You're running your antivirus, you're running the program, and you're hoping and praying that that keeps you safe. Because it works, right? It, it, it Sometimes it will just tell you, hey, you'll get a notification, the virus and threat protection will pop up, and it tells you, we found malware, we found something bad and nefarious. And if you kind of go click resolve, you go press the buttons, the automated security tool will go to fix it, and then you're secure, right? You can feel good and feel better that your computer program has saved the day and protected you. Let me play devil's advocate here for a little bit. What if it doesn't, <laughs> right? What about all those other AV things that we were looking at earlier, those malware samples that we got to see? What if it doesn't trigger on that? That's why we're screaming from the rooftops and shouting about this thing where we have threat hunting, where the hackers, the bad guys, they're really stubborn. They're really dedicated. They're smart, and they want to make sure that their malware, that their payload, they, they want to make sure it really works. So they try all these obfuscation techniques. They go through all these lengths to get something to work. They're dedicated, and they're active and proactive. Maybe we as the good guys, maybe we as the security professionals, maybe we should do the same. Be stubborn, be dedicated, and go look, go hunt for bad stuff like this. Go beyond the dashboard or just what your single plane of glass might tell you. When you add in manual analysis, sure, we know that the automated preventive security is absolutely a must. It is necessary, it's divine. Auto like automation, we could sing the praises over and over again. But if you supplement that, if you augment it with manual analysis just like this, by simply going to look at the file, you can say, hey, that looks really weird. <laughs> that looks bad, right? So trained analysts go look, they go hunt, they understand context, everything Danielle was saying. And those false positives that we always whine about when our SOC or SEAM solution goes off with the bells and whistles, that's okay. I know we whine and complain about false positives a lot, but the real danger are those false negatives that I was just alluding to when there is evil and there is badness and you aren't alerted. But when you have a real human going to look for this stuff, there aren't going to be as many false positives and there aren't going to be any as many false negatives. That's awesome. And you know, because now that we've dug through all those stages and, and layers and of the payload, we've carved out all those different fragments. We see what the code is really doing. It's not just, oh, go remove that initial file, but go remediate and go respond and go remove those corners and crevices that might be left dangling in the registry or those other files that it might have touched or other things that that program might have created. So you stop the problem at the source. I think that's kind of a great thing too. You haven't, you haven't wiped away one fingerprint, but you got rid of them all. So how can we stop bad stuff like this? What's the real takeaway? Now, I, I crossed out the word stop because we all know. We, uh, when we came to that conclusion of assumed breach, of assumed compromise, how can we mitigate or like lessen this stuff? Sure, we could try to stop it with technology. We could throw more money, more computers at it. The software safeguards, maybe the stuff that I was demoing earlier, oh, the batch scripts wouldn't run if we were to disable the command prompt, or the PowerShell code wouldn't execute if we were to lock down the language mode. What about application whitelisting, right? We saw that JScript file. Maybe that wouldn't execute because it's not in a native system folder, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is with these technology solutions, with the software safeguards, <laughs> like, you know, Security is a cat and mouse game, and they've all been bypassed one way or the other. And the hacker's smart and determined, and they're still going to circumvent it and fight through it. Those might not be the solution. They certainly help. Absolutely. They're certainly necessary, but it can't be the end all be all. So we can't solve this with technology. Can we solve it with people? Is cybersecurity not really a technology problem, but more of a of a people problem? Now I hate this answer personally. Like you could ask me, you can ask John, hey, what should I do to secure my computer? That's the thing I, 
that's the question I get from my, from my, maybe my mom or my dad a lot, right? How do I do this? And you see these all the time in the news, the, the boilerplate best practices. It's very soft. It's very high level when they say, Hey, multi-factor everywhere, complex passwords, you know, change your password every, every 90 days or something like that. It's high level. And we keep saying user education, but it's the best we've got. It, it, it sucks to hear that, but user ed, getting people in the know and smarter about this and now going to go do their own threat hunting, looking for indicators of compromise, understanding malware and things like this. That's really what we can do. Let the, let the people in the mix have part of that manual analysis. So if you're questioning, hey, okay, now what? Go do those things. Go patch your systems whenever they come available. Go look for those indicators of compromise. Go validate. Go run auto runs or TCP view or whatever you'd like from the sys internal suite. Maybe you'll do that on one computer. Maybe you can do it on multiple. But the idea is the same. Proactive hunting and really, really looking. Go beyond the dashboard is the, is the real takeaway. Cool. I hope that's enough of me yapping. Sorry for blabbering on for so long, but I hope that was fun. I don't know if anyone, I don't know. I hope I wasn't over anyone's head with some of the code, but I mean, I'd be happy to take any questions or get to know any, whatever everyone thought, anything I can answer for you. I'm certainly happy to. That was fun, John. Thanks for doing that. Cool. I'm happy to hear it. John, I'm probably the least technical person on these calls. And I, I absolutely love when you're doing this. Sweet. I, that's I, awesome. I, I, I like get into it. I'm like, I like this. You know, I don't, I can't follow it all, but I like it. <laughs> also, I need to record your voice as a voiceover for uh, Netflix's Headspace. Oh, geez. Because I think it would relax me better than the voice <laughs> of the person that does it. <laughs> Thanks so much. Tom, Carrie, anyone else on the call? Any questions for John? Or, or for Jeremy or Danielle, for that matter? While we're waiting for a couple of comments or questions, John, I think part of what always is, strikes me being in the security industry coming from various kind of IT backgrounds is that so many security offerings are built by defenders. And so the, the whole idea is like, let's stop everything. That's, <laughs> that's our goal. We're going to stop everything. And ideally, that makes a lot of sense. And like, as a consumer, I want to believe the company that says they will stop everything. And it would just be really easy if I could just buy that one thing and then I'm good. I'm secure now. And it's just an old adage that uh, you on, on the offensive side of things, founders who create things from an offensive security perspective will just laugh at because, and for the reasons that you just showed is that there are so, and, and I'm not, blaming Microsoft, any operating system, any, any software, there are always going to be bugs. There are always going to be vulnerabilities. Now, does Microsoft like not go out of their way to fix something that they started with Windows NT? Maybe there's a case for that, but there's always going to be ways around and through and over and under that defenders aren't going to be able to see until after the fact. And so it's, it, you really have to have an offensive mindset. And uh, how did you get into the offensive world of this whole security thing? Oh, cool. No, thanks. That's a, that's a good question. Um, so it's weird because a lot of people, a lot of folks ask, oh, hey, John, where did, where did you get your chops? How did you, how did you get uh, smart on this is what they say. I don't know why. Um, capture the flag in, in all honesty is one of the things that I kind of fell in love with when I was learning about all of this. Uh, Let's capture every, the flag. Yeah. So, so every kid kind of wants to grow up to be a hacker or they want to make video games, right? Um, there's this thing when you're learning computer science or you're learning cybersecurity and it's, it's a game, it's a sport, it's, it's a puzzle, but not really. Uh, it's just an activity called capture the flag where you're staring at your computer <laughs> for hours on end because you're trying to solve a, a set of problems or you're trying to solve a set of tasks that ask you to do something. Uh, and you'll need to find the flag or a key or a token that kind of can prove that you've accomplished the task. Uh, sometimes it could be 
as vague as break into this website and go find the flag at the root of the file system or something. And you'll need to do, oh, some, some penetration testing. You'll need to go scan for the services, see what's vulnerable. Um, or you'll need to do some binary exploitation or understand cryptography or maybe, maybe look through some memory forensics images and stuff like that. There are tons of different categories for, for capture the flag, but I think it shows you a lot of different realms of security and it makes it fun. It, it makes it a game. It makes it something that people are wanting to play because there's a weird motivation where you see your name up on the scoreboard and you think, oh, I, if I solve one more, I can just, I can get above that guy behind or, or ahead of me. Or, and uh, John was the administrator for my first capture the flag, which was <laughs> just in our last uh, Hackett, uh, Huntress Hackett event. We had a pre-day, w- which was a Huntress workshop. It included, it was in capture the flag style. And I'm not an offensive hacker. So I know a lot of the things that he just said sounded like, oh, I can't do that. If for our next Huntress Hackett, if you see us advertising a pre-day, no matter what your technique, what you feel your technical abilities are, pay the 99 bucks or whatever it is and do that class because it's it's a workshop style. You get guided through it and you start to actually get hands-on keyboard experience with doing some of the stuff that John just took you through and you also get points for it and we're humans. And when things get turned into a game, it's fun. Uh, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm a strong proponent of that. And we run one that anyone could do. I actually have a kind of funny story that I'm going to co-opt uh, from our founders on capture the flag. And I, I'm going to be really careful about what I say here because I don't want to get anybody in trouble. <laughs> but um, so DEF CON capture the flag, right? That's uh, the DEF CON conference is one of the biggest cybersecurity conference or hacker conferences in the world. It's usually held in Las Vegas and they have a capture the flag event. I think, Jeremy, I think you referenced this in your presentation that our founders won the capture the flag event at DEF CON, which is like it's like the world series of hacking, right? They won the world series of hacking and uh one of the founders, I'll not, I'll not mention who, but one of the founders had told me a story that when you walk into that room at DEF CON Capture the Flag, you're looking at the best hackers from all around the world. And at that time, I believe at least one of our founders was Active Air Force. And so he walked into the room and it's kind of one of those things where you just tip your head and acknowledge the other folks in the room from the other countries, because if you were to speak words verbally to them, if you were to have a conversation with them or acknowledge them verbally, they would have to submit a report to their higher ups (laughs) to acknowledge the interaction. This is how, you know, this is how advanced kind of the level of cybersecurity was for our founders. And that ties into the product as well, because essentially what they've done is they've taken their know-how from being offensive cyber warfare operators and the techniques that they used to use to breach any and all targets. I mean, could you imagine if they were given an assignment and they said, actually, you know, guys, I, I can't do this. There's just no way to break in. There's there's just no way for me to access this target. And they kind of threw up their hands and abandoned their mission. It just would never happen, right? You just, you can't do that when you're working for the NSA. So what would happen is, um, is what they did is they turned kind of their know-how that they used to use on the offensive side and then reverse engineered a lot of those techniques to turn that into a product that can detect when those same threats are are happening to you. Hey, John, I do have a question for you. So you put up that slide that said, can be bypassed, can be bypassed, can be bypassed. So I look at the, the layering of security that we can put out there. Right. And, you you know, start a DNS filter and, you know, uh, put a bunch of other things on there, let's say, without Huntress per se. Right. Um, Without physical access to that machine, is there not a point where you can't, I mean, aside from pulling, you know, the network plug, (laughs) um, right, and air gapping it, is there literally no way to, to stop someone gaining entrance? I I hate to, and I can't say with any amount of like certainty, like a thousand percent guarantee. uh, uh, Yes. A thousand they're They're going to get in all the time, every time, or no, we're going to stop them all the time, every time. Um, I, I, 
think that it is absolutely important that at every level, uh, at every where wherever you can add segmentation and compartmentization of your network or uh, layering your security stack, and we say it all the time, but it's that whole idea of, of defense in depth. Uh, because while yes, I, I am enumerating all of these technologies and all these software safeguards where I say, hey, asterisk, <laughs> disclaimer, this can be bypassed, it will still stump one actor. Maybe not the next one, but one or two or three. And, and that percentage starts to dwindle down. Uh, I think that really goes into the, the fishnet idea that Danielle was, was showcasing earlier. Uh, so I don't mean to be throwing anything off the table when I have that can be bypassed disclaimer. Um, it just goes to show that all of these things can play a part and it can make that attack surface smaller and thinner and we, yeah. I hope, two, I hope that's kind of the idea. Yeah, two cliches that kind of help out here is one, <laughs> you don't have to like outrun uh, the bear. You just have to be faster than the guy you're running to next to you. <laughs> and so that, that actually, it's, it's pretty old in cybersecurity, but it's really true. Like you don't have to be the most secure company, organization, whatever on the planet. You just need to be above your peer group and put enough hurdles that unfortunately the, the person next to you looks like a lower hanging fruit. And then the other thing is from the premise of the question, I would think about it more like if you live in Florida, you're not going to stop hurricanes. You're just going to build a, your foundation, your building, everything to withstand them and know that you, there are going to be some times where you need storm shutters. Like security incidents are really more like natural disasters. They are going to happen. And it's just about preparing so that a, a building, like I'm in Austin, Texas, right? There's been a couple of uh, hurricanes that took direct hits off of the corporate coast of Corpus Christi recently that just leveled entire neighborhoods because they weren't built for that. Because when those areas were built, hurricanes didn't come and take direct hits there. So it was different building standards. And they didn't have the imagination to need to prepare for that versus you go to somewhere uh, like Florida, where, of course, the, everything is built to withstand that. And that's really the similar way that cybersecurity is built. If you feel like you're a bigger target and you know the risk of what happens if you're going to get, uh, get breached, you prepare differently than if, ah, no one's going to be after me. But the problem is, since attackers have automated all of these attacks at scale, it's not about who they're targeting. It's just about who clicks and enters their funnel. And it just becomes lowest hanging fruit. And as John sh uh, showed that like the persistence happens with the initial malware install, a lot of times, and, and this is where these like long dwelling statistics come from. A lot of times that just enters you into the, like the, the and I'm just going to use ransomware that enters, enters you into the ransomware gang sales funnel. So now you're at the top of the funnel because somebody clicked something and it might take a few weeks, a couple of months for them to get around to actually checking out your organization and then seeing if they can still have access, move laterally, steal credentials. And it's not that like, oh, they're in there and they're waiting and listening to everything. No, they just haven't got around to you yet. Right. And they don't need to because their access is sitting there dwelling. And since your initial uh, preventative measures didn't catch the first thing, there's no rush for them. And John, did I misstate that in any way? No, uh, you're absolutely right, especially on the the lowest hanging fruit mentality. It's a that's the target. They work smarter, not harder, and they're smart. So. <laughs> And it's and the bad actors only have to be right one time in order to gain access. I mean, it's an unfortunate fact. As a defender, as an MSP, you have to be right 100 percent of the time. It's not easy. It is it's not it's not an easy job at all. That's that's why you want to mount your defenses so that you know if something does happen, you want to be able to prevent it if 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 you can. But if you can't, you want to have a, a systemic form, um, a, a systemic kind of rule book that you guys can follow or products that you guys can have to help deal with it if, it if it does manage to get through that one time. Cool. 
Anyone Steve, else? bring us home, brother. I think everyone's. Uh, I think everyone's a little brain dead. This was. Uh, this was fantastic, and I know our members will, will watch the recording of it um, after the fact. But first of all, for a Friday afternoon, right before the holiday weekend, I don't know. I don't know who picked the state and got you guys to do this. I'm not sure how that happened. She's on vacation, by the way. We we kicked her out this morning. So, um, but we'll talk about that later as far as that happened, but always enjoy this. Always enjoy listening to the three of you. Glad to see the three of you again. Um, excited to hopefully see people in person again at some of the events. Um, as we go, I know that tends to be salesy sales side, not, not this, but uh, we'd love to have you guys visit us at groups when we meet um, where it's, you know, 10 of us sitting around a table talking and not, not presenting and not doing the slideshow and really just having conversation about what you guys do. Um, Chomping at the bit, right? Definitely. And and listen, I'm sold now. I'm ready, and and you can't deliver yet. So uh, someone in my one of my peer groups will call me up and say we're ready for Mac and let's get going. Um, so we'll, we'll go <laughs> from there. But I I am definitely ready. So great job, everybody. Those that attended, thank you for joining. Um, and we will have a good, safe weekend. Um, everybody, enjoy. Shut down, please, everyone. Should shut down, shut down and get outside, right? Um, both of those two things. And we will see you all next month. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Our pleasure. Have a good weekend.